Words of Cheer for Daily Life Messages to Encourage the Heart Written by Charles H. Spurgeon Narrated by Scython Williams Chapter 1 Sons of Jacob For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Malachi 3, 6 The sons of Jacob refers to people who enjoy specific rights and titles. Jacob had no rights by birth, but he soon acquired them. He exchanged the mess of pottage with his brother Esau and thus gained the birthright. Genesis 25, 30-33 I do not justify the means, but he also obtained the blessing, and so acquired special rights. The sons of Jacob refers to people who have specific rights and titles. Scripture, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 1, 12. They have a claim in the blood of Christ. They have a right to enter in through the gates into the city. Revelation 22, 14. They have a title to eternal honors. They have a promise of everlasting glory. They have a right to call themselves sons of God. There are special rights and privileges belonging to the sons of Jacob. These sons of Jacob were men of specific manifestations. Jacob had experienced special manifestations from his God, and thus he was highly honored. Once at night time he lay down and slept. He had the hedges for his curtains, the sky for his canopy, a stone for his pillow, and the earth for his bed. Then he had a special manifestation. There was a ladder, and he saw the angels of God ascending and descending. Genesis 28. He thus had a manifestation of Christ Jesus as the ladder that reaches from earth to heaven, up and down which angels came to bring us mercies. Jacob had another special manifestation at Mahanaim when the angels of God met him. Genesis 32, 1 2. And again at Peniel when he wrestled with God and saw him face to face. Genesis 32, 24 30. Those were special manifestations, and this passage refers to those who, like Jacob, have had special manifestations. The sons of Jacob have had special manifestations. They have talked with God as a man talks with his friend. Exodus 33:11. They have whispered in the ear of the Lord. Christ has been with them to eat with them, and they with Christ. The Holy Spirit has shined into their souls with such a mighty radiance that they could not doubt the special manifestations. The sons of Jacob are the men who enjoy these manifestations. The sons of Jacob are men of special trials. Poor Jacob! I would not choose Jacob's circumstances if I didn't have the anticipation of Jacob's blessing, for his situation was a difficult one. He had to run away from his father's house to Laban's, and then that surly old Laban cheated him all the years he was there. Laban cheated Jacob regarding his wife, cheated him in his wages, cheated him in his flocks, and cheated him all through the story. Eventually he had to run away from Laban, who pursued him and overtook him. Next came Esau, with four hundred men to cut him up root and branch. Then there was a season of prayer, and afterward he wrestled and had to go all his life with his thigh out of joint. A little later his dear beloved Rachel died. Then his daughter Dinah was led astray, and his sons murdered the Shechemites. Before long his dear Joseph was sold into Egypt, and a famine came. Then Reuben went up to Jacob's bed and defiled it. Judah committed incest with his own daughter-in-law, and all his sons became a plague to him. At last Benjamin was taken away. And the elderly Jacob, almost broken hearted, cried out, Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. Genesis 42 36. 
Never was a man more tried than Jacob, all through the one sin of cheating his brother. All through his life God chastised him, but I believe there are many who can sympathize with dear old Jacob. They have had to pass through trials very much like his. Well, cross-bearers, God says, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Malachi 3, 6. Poor tried souls, you are not consumed because of the unchanging nature of your God. Now do not despair, and say with the self-conceit of misery, I am the man who hath seen affliction. Lamentations 3, 1. The man of sorrows, Isaiah 53, 3, was afflicted more than you. Jesus was indeed a mourner. You only see the fringes of the garments of affliction. You never have trials like his. You do not understand what troubles mean. You have hardly sipped the cup of trouble. You have only had a drop or two, but Jesus drank the entire cup. Scripture? Fear not, God says. Isaiah 41, 10. I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob, men of special trials, are not consumed. The sons of Jacob are men of special character. Although there were some things about Jacob's character that we cannot commend, there are one or two things that God commends. There was Jacob's faith, by which Jacob had his name written among the mighty worthies who did not obtain the promises on earth, but will obtain them in heaven. Are you a person of faith, beloved? Do you know what it is to walk by faith, to live by faith, to get your temporary food by faith, and to live on spiritual manner all by faith? Is faith the rule of your life? If so, you are one of the sons of Jacob. Jacob was a man of prayer. He was a man who wrestled and groaned and prayed. Ah, you poor heathen, don't you pray? No, you say, I never thought of such a thing. I have not prayed in years. Well, I hope you will before you die. If you live and die without prayer, you will not be able to pray either when you get to hell. There is a woman who was so busy sending her children to Sunday school that she said she had no time to pray. No time to pray? Did you have time to get dressed? There is a time for every purpose under heaven, and if you had determined to pray, you would have prayed. Children of God cannot live without prayer. They are wrestling Jacobs. They are people in whom the Holy Spirit so works that they can no more live without prayer than they can live without breathing. They must pray. If you are living without prayer, you are living without Christ, and if you die like that, your part will be in the lake which burneth with fire. Revelation 21, 8. May God redeem you and rescue you from such a fate. You who are the sons of Jacob, though, take comfort, for God is unchangeable. Chapter 2 Faith versus Fear. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Matthew 8 26. When the believer is brought into peace with God, he doesn't tremble at the thought of God's power. He doesn't ask, Will he plead against me with his great power? Instead, he says, No, that very power, once my terror and fear, is now my refuge and my hope, for he will put that very power in me. I rejoice that God is almighty, for he will lend me his omnipotence. He will put strength into me. Job 23, 6. The very power that would have damned my soul now saves my soul. God puts into me the very power that would have crushed me so that the work of salvation may be accomplished. No, He will not use it to crush me, but He will put that very strength into me. Do you see there the Mighty One upon His throne? Dread Sovereign, 
I see your powerful arm. Will you crush the sinner? Will you utterly destroy him with your strength? No, he says. Come here, child. Then, if you go to his almighty throne, he says, I give to you the same arm that made you tremble before. Go out and live. I have made you mighty as I am, so you can do my works. I will put strength into you. The same strength that would have broken you to pieces on the wheel will now be put into you so that you can do mighty works. This great strength sometimes goes out in prayer. Did you ever hear a man pray in whom God had put strength? You have heard some of us poor, weak souls pray, I dare say, but have you ever heard a man pray whom God had made into a giant? Oh, if you have, you will say it is a mighty thing to hear such a man in supplication. I have seen him as if he had seized the angel and would pull him down. I have seen him now and then slip in his wrestling, but, like a giant, he has recovered his footing and seemed, like Jacob, to hurl the angel to the ground. I have observed the man lay hold upon the throne of mercy and declare, I will not let you go, except thou bless me. Genesis 32, 26. I have seen him, when heaven's gates have been apparently barred, go up to them and say, You gates, open wide in Jesus' name. And I have seen the gates fly open before him, as if the man were God himself, for he is armed with God Almighty's strength. I have seen that man, in prayer, discover some great mountain in his way, and he prayed it down until it became a very molehill. He has beaten the hills and made them like chaff by the immensity of his might. Some of you think I am talking in exaggeration, but such cases have been seen in the past, and they are still seen now. Oh, to have heard Martin Luther pray! When Philip Melanchthon was dying, Luther went to his deathbed and said, Melanchthon, you will not die. Oh, said Melanchthon, I must die. It is a world of toil and trouble. Melanchthon, Luther said, I have need of you, and God's cause has need of you, and as my name is Luther, you will not die. The physician said he would die. Well, down went Luther on his knees, and he began to tug at death. Old death struggled mightily for Melanchthon, and he had nearly got him on his shoulders. Drop him, said Luther. Drop him, I want him. No, said death, he is my prey, I will take him. Down with him, said Luther. Down with him, death, or I will wrestle with you. Luther seemed to take hold of the grim monster and hurl him to the ground. Martin Luther came off victorious, like an Orpheus with his wife up from the very shades of death. He had delivered Melanchthon from death by prayer. Oh, you say, that's an extraordinary case. No, not half as extraordinary as you think. Men and women have done the same in other cases. They have asked something of God and have had it. They have been to the throne, showed a promise, and said they would not come away without its fulfillment, and they have come back from God's throne, having succeeded in prayer with the Almighty, for prayer moves the arm that moves the world. Prayer is the sinew of God, someone said. It moves His arm. And so it is. Truly, in prayer, with the strength of a faithful heart, there is a beautiful fulfillment of the text, He would put strength in me. Not only in prayer, but in duty. The man who has great faith in God, and whom God has girded with strength, how gigantic does he become! Have you never read of those great heroes who put to flight whole armies, and scattered kings like the snow on Salmon? Psalm 68, 14. Have you never read of those men who were fearless of foes, and marched onward before all their opposers, as if they would just as soon die as live? I read of a case in the old Church of Scotland that was before that King James who wanted to force his preferred form of government upon them. Andrew Melville and some of his associates were deputed to wait upon the king, 
and as they were going with a written scroll ready, they were warned to take care and return, for their lives were at stake. They paused a moment, and Andrew said, I am not afraid, thank God, nor feeble spirited in the cause and message of Christ. Come what pleases God to send, our commission will be carried out. At these words the deputation took courage and went forward. On reaching the palace and having obtained an audience, they found His Majesty attended by Lennox and Arran and several other lords, all of whom were English. They presented their remonstrance. Arran lifted it from the table and glanced over it. He then turned to the ministers and furiously demanded, Who dares sign these treasonable articles? We dare, said Andrew Melville, and will give our lives in the cause. Having thus spoken, he came forward to the table, took the pen, subscribed his name, and was followed by his brethren. Arran and Lennox were confounded. The king looked on in silence, and the nobles in surprise. This is how our good forefathers appeared before kings, and yet were not ashamed. Scripture The proud have had me greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. Psalm 119.51 Having thus discharged their duty, after a brief conference the ministers were permitted to depart in peace. The king trembled more at them than if a whole army had been at his gates. Why was this? It was because God had put his own strength into them to make them masters of their duty. You have some such people in your midst now. They may be despised, but God has made them like the lion like men of David, who would go down into the pit in the depth of winter and take the lion by the throat and slay him. 2 Samuel 23 20. We have some in our churches, but only a remnant, I admit, who are not afraid to serve their God, like Abdiel, faithful found among the faithless, faithful only he. We have some who are superior to the customs of the age, who refuse to bow at Mammon's knee, and who will not use the ornamental language of too many modern ministers, but stand out for God's gospel and the pure white banner of Christ, unstained and unspotted by the doctrines of men. Then they are mighty. They are mighty because God has put strength in them. Will I hold on to the end? asked the believer. Yes, you will, for God's strength is in you. Will I be able to bear such and such a trial? Yes, you will. Cannot omnipotence stem the torrent? Certainly he can, and omnipotence is in you, for like Ignatius of old you are a God-bearer. You carry God about with you. Your heart is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and you will yet overcome. But can I ever stand firm in such and such an evil day? Yes, you will, for God will put his strength in you. I was with some ministers some time ago when one of them observed, Brother, if there were to be stakes in Smithfield again, I am afraid they would find very few to burn among us. Well, I said, I don't know anything about how you would burn, but I know very well that there will never be any lack of men who are ready to die for Christ. Oh, he said, but they are not the right sort of men. Well, I said, but do you think they are the Lord's children? Yes, I believe they are, but they are not the right sort. Ah, I replied, but you would find them the right sort if they came to the test, every one of them. They do not have burning grace yet. What would be the use of it? We do not need the grace until the stakes come, but we should have burning grace in burning moments. If a hundred of us were now called to die for Christ, I believe there would not only be found a hundred, but five hundred who would march to death and sing all the way. Whenever I find faith, I believe that God will put strength into the person, and I never think anything to be impossible to someone who has true faith in God as long as it is written, He would put strength in me. Caesar could not swim the Tiber River, clothed as he was in his military garb. And do you hope to swim the Jordan with your flesh about you? No. 
for you will sink then, unless Jesus will lift you from Jordan and carry you across the stream as Aeneas lifted Anchises upon his shoulders from the flames of Rome. You will never be able to walk across the river. You will never be able to face that tyrant, death, and smile in his face, unless you have something more than mortal flesh. You will need to have the belt of divinity around you, or else your strength will fail you when you need it most. Many a person has ventured to the Jordan in his own strength, but oh, how he has shrieked and howled when the first wave touched his feet. There was never a weakling who went to death with God within him who did not find himself mightier than the grave. Go on, Christian, for this is your promise, he would put strength in me. Weak though I am, yet through his might I all things can perform. Go on, do not dread God's power, but rejoice that he will put his strength in you. He will not use his power to crush you. Chapter 3 Liberty from the Fear of Death Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 The true-born child of God serves his master well. As Ralph Erskine wrote, Slight now his loving precepts if they can, No, no, his conquering kindness leads the van. When everlasting love exerts the sway, they judge themselves most kindly bound to obey. Bound by redeeming love in stricter sense than ever Adam was in innocence. Scripture Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 From the Fear of Death O oh, death! How many sweet cups you have made bitter! O oh, death! How many celebrations you have broken up! O oh, death! How many gluttonous banquets you have spoiled! O oh, death! How many sinful pleasures you have turned into pain! Take the telescope and look through the view of a few years, and what do you see? Grim death is in the distance, grasping his scythe. He is coming, coming, coming. And what is behind him? That depends upon your own character. If you are a child of God, there is the palm branch. If you are not, you know what follows death. Hell follows him. O oh, death, your ghost has haunted many houses where sin otherwise would have rioted. O oh, death, your cold hand has touched many hearts that were big with lust and has made them wince in terror from their crime. Oh, how many people are slaves to the fear of death! Half the people in the world are afraid to die. There are some madmen who can march up to the cannon's mouth. There are some fools who rush with bloody hands before their Maker's judgment seat. However, most people are afraid to die. Who is the person who is not afraid to die? I will tell you. The person who is a believer. Fear to die. Thank God I do not. The cholera may come again. I pray to God that it will not, but if it does, it doesn't matter to me. I will work and visit the sick by night and by day until I drop. And if it takes me, sudden death is sudden glory. This is how it is with even the weakest saint. The prospect of death does not make you tremble. Sometimes you fear, but more often you rejoice. You sit down and calmly think of dying. What is death? It is a low porch through which you stoop to enter heaven. What is life? It is a narrow screen that separates us from glory, and death kindly removes it. I remember a saying of a good old woman who said, Afraid to die, sir? I have dipped my foot in Jordan every morning before breakfast for the last fifty years, and do you think I am afraid to die now? Die? Why, we die hundreds of times. We die daily, 1 Corinthians 15, 31. We die every morning. We die each night when we sleep. 
By faith we die. Dying will be old work when we come to it. We will say, Ah, death, you and I have been old acquaintances. I have had you in my bedroom every night. I have talked with you each day. I have had the skull upon my dressing table, and I have often thought of you. Death, you have come at last, but you are a welcome guest. You are an angel of light, and the best friend I have had. Why then would you dread death, since there is no fear of God's leaving you when you come to die? Here I must tell you that anecdote of the good Welsh lady who, when she lay dying, was visited by her minister. He said to her, Sister, are you sinking? She answered him not a word, but looked at him with an incredulous eye. He repeated the question, Sister, are you sinking? She looked at him again as if she could not believe that he would ask such a question. At last, rising a little in the bed, she said, Sinking? Sinking? Did you ever know a sinner sink through a rock? If I had been standing on the sand, I might sink. But, thank God, I am on the rock of ages, and there is no sinking there. How glorious to die! O angels, come! O cohorts of the Lord of hosts, stretch, stretch your broad wings and lift us up from earth! O winged seraphs, bear us far above the reach of these inferior things! But, until you come, I will sing, Since Jesus is mine, I'll not fear undressing, but gladly put off these garments of clay. To die in the Lord is a covenant blessing, since Jesus to glory through death led the way. But there are two sides to such questions as this. There are some glorious things that we are free to. Not only are we freed from sin in every sense from the law and from the fear of death, but we are free to do something. Scripture, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and that liberty gives us certain rights and privileges. We are free to heaven's charter. There is heaven's charter, the magna charter of heaven, the Bible, and you are free to it. There is a fine passage, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Isaiah 43, 2. You are free to that. Here is another. Mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart. Isaiah 54, 10. You are free to that. Here is another. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. John 13, 1. You are free to that. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Here is a chapter regarding election. You are free to that if you are elect. Here is another that speaks of the non condemnation of the righteous and their justification. You are free to that. You are free to all that is in the Bible. It is a never failing treasure filled with boundless stores of grace. It is the bank of heaven. You may draw from it as much as you please without obstruction or hindrance. Bring nothing with you except faith. Bring as much faith as you can get, and you are welcome to all that is in the Bible. There is not a promise, not a word in it, that is not yours. In the depths of tribulation, let it comfort you. Amid waves of distress, let it cheer you. When sorrows surround you, let it be your helper. This is your Father's token of love. Never let it be closed up and covered with dust. You are free to it. Use then your freedom. We are free to the throne of grace. It is the privilege of Englishmen to always be able to send a petition to Parliament, and it is the privilege of believers to always be able to send a petition to the throne of God. I am free to God's throne. If I want to talk to God tomorrow morning, I can. If tonight I want to have a conversation with my master, I can go to him. I have a right to go to his throne. It doesn't matter how much I have sinned. I go and ask for forgiveness. It doesn't matter how poor I am. I go and plead his promise that he will provide all things needful. 
I have a right to go to his throne at all times, in midnight's darkest hour or in noonday's heat. Wherever I am, if fate commands me to the utmost verge of the wide earth, I still have constant admission to his throne. Use that right, beloved, use that right. There's not one of you who lives up to his privilege. Many gentlemen will live beyond their incomes, spending more than they have coming in, but there is not a Christian who lives up to his spiritual income. You have an infinite income, an income of promises, an income of grace, and no Christian ever lived up to his income. Some people say, if I had more money, I would have a larger house, and horses, and a carriage, and so on. That is very well and good, but I wish Christians would do the same. I wish they would set up a larger house and do greater things for God. I wish they would look more happy and take those tears away from their eyes. With such treasures in the bank and so much in hand that God gives you, you have no right to be poor. Get up and rejoice, rejoice! The Christian should live up to his income and not below it. Turn then, my soul, unto thy rest, the ransom of thy great high priest hath set the captive free. Trust to his efficacious blood, nor fear thy banishment from God, since Jesus died for thee. Chapter 4 Suffering and Consolation For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. 2 Corinthians 1 5. As the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so the consolations of Christ abound. This is a blessed proportion. God always keeps a pair of scales. In one side he puts his people's trials, and in the other side he puts their consolations. When the scale of trial is nearly empty, you will always find the scale of consolation in nearly the same condition. When the scale of trials is full, you will find the scale of consolation just as heavy. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, even so will consolation abound by Christ. 2 Corinthians 1 5. This is a matter of pure experience. Oh, it is mysterious that when the black clouds gather most, the light within us is always the brightest. When the night lowers and the tempest is coming on, the heavenly captain is always closest to his crew. It is a blessed thing that when we are most cast down, we are then most lifted up by the consolations of Christ. Trials make more room for consolation. There's nothing that makes someone have a big heart like a great trial. I always find that little miserable people, whose hearts are about the size of a grain of mustard seed, have never had much to try them. I have found that those people who have no sympathy for their fellows, who never weep for the sorrows of others, very seldom have had any woes of their own. Great hearts can only be made by great troubles. The spade of trouble digs the reservoir of comfort deeper, and makes more room for consolation. When God comes into our heart and finds it full, He begins to break our comforts and to make it empty. Then there is more room for grace. The humbler a person is, the more comfort he will have. I remember walking with a farmer who was plowing one day. Although he was a farmer, he was a man who was deeply taught. I think some farmers would make much better preachers than many college gentlemen. This farmer said to me, You can depend upon it that if you or I ever get one inch above the ground, we will get just that inch too high. I believe it is true, for the lower we lie and the nearer to the ground we are, the more our troubles humble us, and the more fit we are to receive comfort. God always gives us comfort when we are most fit for it. That is one reason why consolations increase in the same ratio as our trials. Trouble exercises our graces, and the very exercise of our graces tends to make us more comfortable and happy. Where showers fall most, there the grass is greenest. I suppose the fogs and mists of Ireland make it the Emerald Isle. 
Wherever you find great fogs of trouble and mists of sorrow, you will always find emerald green hearts that are full of the beautiful verdure of the comfort and love of God. O Christian, do not say, Where have the swallows gone? They are gone, they are dead. They are not dead. They have skimmed the purple sea and have gone to a far off land, but they will be back again in time. Child of God, do not say that the flowers are dead, that winter has killed them and they are gone. No, although winter has coated them with the cover of its snow, they will put up their heads again and will be alive very soon. Child of God, do not say that the sun is quenched because the cloud has hidden it. No, it is behind there, preparing summer for you, for when it comes out again, it will have made the clouds ready to drop in April showers, all of them mothers of the sweet May flowers. Above all, when your God hides his face, do not say that he has forgotten you. He is only tarrying a little while to make you love him better. When he comes, you will have joy in the Lord, and will rejoice with joy unspeakable. 1 Peter 1 8. Waiting exercises our grace. Waiting tests our faith. Therefore, wait in hope, for although the promise tarries, it can never come too late. Another reason why we are often most happy in our troubles is that it is then that we have the closest dealings with God. I speak from heart knowledge and real experience. We never have such close dealings with God as when we are in tribulation. When the barn is full, we can live without God. When the safe is bursting with gold, we somehow can do without as much prayer. But once your gourds have been taken away, Jonah 4, you want your God. Once the idols are cleansed away out of the house, then you must go and honor the Lord. Some of you do not pray half as much as you should. When it's a fine day, the child might walk before his father, but if there is a lion in the road, he comes and takes his father's hand. He could run half a mile in front of his father when all was fine and fair, but once the lion appears, the boy yells, Father, Father, and gets as close to him as he can. It's the same with the Christian. When all is well, he forgets God. Jeshurun grows fat, and he begins to kick against God. Deuteronomy 32, 15. But take away his hopes, blast his joys, let the infant lie in the coffin, let the crops be blasted, let the herd be cut off from the stall, let the husband's broad shoulder lie in the grave, and let the children be fatherless, and then it is that God is a God indeed. O oh, take from me all I have, make me poor, a beggar, penniless and helpless. Dash that cistern in pieces, crush that hope, quench the stars, put out the sun, shroud the moon in darkness, and place me all alone in space, without a friend and without a helper. And still, out of the depths will I cry unto you, O God. Psalm 130, 1. There is no cry as good as that which comes from the bottom of the mountains. There is no prayer half as fervent as that which comes up from the depths of the soul through deep trials and afflictions. They bring us to God, and we are happier, for the way to be happy is to live near God. While troubles abound, they drive us to God, and then consolations abound. Some people call troubles weights. Truly, they are. A ship that has large sails and a fair wind needs ballast. Troubles are the ballast of a believer. The eyes are the pumps that carry the bilge water out of his soul and keep him from sinking. But if trials are weights, I will tell you a happy secret. There is such a thing as making a weight lift you. If I have a weight chained to me, it keeps me down. But give me pulleys and certain implements, and I can make it lift me up. Yes, there is such a thing as making troubles raise me toward heaven. A gentleman once asked a friend about a beautiful horse of his that was feeding about in the pasture with a clog on its foot. Why do you clog such a noble animal? Sir, he said, I would much rather clog him than lose him. 
He is known to leap hedges. That's why God clogs His people. He would rather clog them than lose them, for if He did not clog them, they would leap the hedges and be gone. They need a tether to prevent their straying, and their God binds them with afflictions to keep them near to Him, to preserve them, and to have them in His presence. It is a blessed fact that as our troubles abound, our consolations also abound. Chapter 5 The Saints Are Kings And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Revelation 5 10. Take the royal office of the saints. They are kings. They are not merely to be kings in heaven, but they are also kings on earth. The Bible declares, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. 1 Peter 2 9. We are kings even now. I want you to understand that before I explain the idea. Every saint of the living God not merely has the prospect of being a king in heaven, but positively, in the sight of God, he is a king now. He must say, with regard to his brethren and himself, and have made us, even now, unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Revelation 5.10. A Christian is a king. He's not simply like a king, but he is a king, actually and truly. I will show you how he is like a king. Remember his royal ancestry. What a fuss some people make about their grandfathers and grandmothers and distant ancestors. I remember seeing in Trinity College the pedigree of some great lord, that went back just as far as Adam, and Adam, the first man, was there digging the ground. It was traced all the way up. Of course, I didn't believe it. I have heard of some pedigrees that go back further. I leave that to your own common sense to believe it or not. What would some people give for a pedigree in which will be found dukes, marquises, kings, and princes? I believe, however, that it's not what our ancestors were, but what we are, that will make us shine before God. It's not so much in knowing that we have royal or priestly blood in our veins, as knowing that we are an honor to our race, that we are walking in the ways of the Lord, and that we are reflecting credit upon the church and upon the grace that makes us honorable. But since some people will glory in their descent, I will glory that the saints have the proudest ancestry in all the world. Talk of Caesars or of Alexanders, or even tell me of a king or queen, and I say that I am of as high descent as the proudest monarch in the world. I am descended from the king of kings. The saint may well speak of his ancestry. He may exult in it and glory in it, for he is a child of God. Positively and actually. His mother, the church, is the bride of Jesus. He is a twice born child of heaven. He is one of the blood royal of the universe. The poorest woman or man on earth who loves Christ is of a royal line. Give a man the grace of God in his heart, and his ancestry is noble. I can turn back the roll of my pedigree, and I can tell you that it is so ancient that it has no beginning. It is more ancient than all the roles of mighty men put together. For my Father existed from all eternity, and therefore I have indeed a true, royal, and ancient ancestry. Also, the saints, like monarchs, have a splendid retinue. Kings and monarchs cannot travel without a deal of pomp. In olden times, they had far more magnificence than they have now, but even in these days, we see much of it when royalty is abroad. There must be a particular kind of horse, and a splendid carriage, and attendants, with all the accompanying show of magnificence. The kings of God, whom Jesus Christ has made kings and priests unto their God, also have a royal retinue. Oh, you say, I see some of them in rags. They are walking through the earth alone, sometimes without a helper or a friend. The fault there is in your eyes. 
If you had eyes to see, you would perceive a bodyguard of angels always attending every one of the blood-bought family. Remember that Elijah's servant could not see anything around Elijah until his master opened his eyes, and then he could see that there were horses and chariots all around Elijah. Well, there are horses and chariots around me, and you, saint of the Lord, wherever you are, there are horses and chariots. In that bedchamber where I was born, angels stood to announce my birth on high. In seas of trouble, when wave after wave seems to go over me, angels are there to lift up my head. When I come to die, when sorrowing friends will weep and carry me to the grave, angels will stand by my casket. When I am put into the grave, some mighty angel will stand and guard my dust and contend for its possession with the devil. Why should I fear? I have a company of angels around me, and whenever I walk abroad, the glorious cherubim accompany me. Kings and princes have certain things that are theirs by perspective right. For instance, Her Majesty has her Buckingham Palace, her other palaces, her crown royal, her scepter, and so on. But does a saint have a palace? Yes, I have a palace. Its walls are not made of marble, but of gold. Its borders are precious stones and gems. Its windows are of agates. Its stones are laid with fine colors. Around it there is a profusion of every costly thing. Rubies sparkle here and there. Pearls are common stones within it. Some call it a mansion, but I have a right to call it a palace, for I am a king. It is a mansion when I look at God. It is a palace when I look at men, because it is the habitation of a prince. Observe where this palace is. I am not a prince of India. I have no inheritance in any far off land that people dream of. It's not an imaginary or mythical place, but it is real. It stands over there on the hills of heaven. I don't know its position among the other mansions of heaven, but there it stands, and I know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, I have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5 1. Do Christians have a crown, too? Oh, yes, but they don't wear it every day. They have a crown, but their coronation day has not yet arrived. They have been anointed monarchs, and they have some of the authority and dignity of monarchs, but they are not yet crowned monarchs. However, the crown is made. God will not have to order heaven's goldsmiths to make it later. It is made already, and is hanging up in glory. Scripture? God has laid up for me a crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 8. O saint, if you would just open some secret door in heaven and go into the treasure chamber, you would see it filled with crowns. When Cortes entered the palace of Montezuma, he found a secret chamber bricked up, and so many different things were stored in there that he thought the wealth of all the world was there. If you could enter God's secret treasure house, what wealth you would see! Are there so many monarchs, you would say, so many crowns, so many princes? Yes, and some shining angel would say, Do you see that crown? It is yours. And if you were to look within, you would read, Made for a sinner saved by grace, whose name was. Then you would hardly believe your eyes for you would see your own name engraved upon it. You are indeed a king before God, for you have a crown laid up in heaven. Whatever other insignia belong to monarchs, saints will have more. They will have robes of whiteness, they will have harps of glory, they will have all things that are appropriate for their regal state. We are indeed real monarchs, not mock monarchs clothed in purple garments of derision, and scoffed at with, Hail, King of the Jews, John 19, 2-3. But we are real monarchs. He has made us kings and priests unto our God. Revelation 1, 6. Kings are considered the most honorable among men. They are always looked up to and respected. 
If you would say, A monarch is here, a crowd would give way. I would not command much respect if I were to attempt to move about in a crowd, but if anyone would shout, Here is the queen, everyone would step aside and make room for her. A monarch generally commands respect. We think that worldly princes are the most honorable of the earth, but if you were to ask God, he would reply, My saints in whom I delight, these are the honorable ones. Don't tell me of tinsel and trifles. Don't tell me of gold and silver or of diamonds and pearls. Don't tell me of ancestry and rank. Don't preach to me of pomp and power. However, tell me that a man is a saint of the Lord, for then he is an honorable man. God respects him, angels respect him, and the universe will one day respect him, when Christ will come to call him to give an account of his life and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew 25, 23. You might despise a child of God now, sinner. You might laugh at him. You might say he is a hypocrite. You might call him a saint, fanatic, and everything you like, but know that those titles will not mar his dignity, for he is one of the honorable of the earth, and God values him as such. Some people will say, I wish you would prove what you claim when you say that saints are kings, for if we were kings we would never have any sorrows. Kings are never poor as we are, and they never suffer as we do. Who told you so? You say that if you are kings you would live at ease. Do not kings ever suffer? Was not David an anointed king? Was he not hunted like a partridge on the mountains? 1 Samuel 26, 20. Did not the king himself pass over the brook Kidron with all his people weeping as he went when his son Absalom pursued him? 2 Samuel 15, 23. Was he not a monarch when he slept on the cold ground with no bed except the damp ground? Yes, kings have their sorrows. Crowned heads have their afflictions. Very often, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Don't think that because you are a king you will have no sorrows. Scripture? It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink. Proverbs 31, 4. This is often so. The saints get only a little wine here. It's not for kings to drink the wine of pleasure. It's not for kings to have much of the intoxicating drink and the excesses of this world's delight. They will have joy enough up in heaven when they will drink it new in their Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. Poor saint! Dwell on this. You are a king. I urge you not to let this leave your mind, but even in the midst of your tribulation, still rejoice in it. If you must go through the dark tunnel of humiliation for Christ's name, if you are ridiculed and reviled, still rejoice in the fact, I am a king, and all the dominions of the earth will be mine. Chapter 6 The Holy Spirit, a Comforter. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 14 26. God the Holy Spirit is a very loving Comforter. I am in distress, and I need consolation. Some passer-by hears of my sorrow, and he steps within, sits down, and attempts to cheer me up. He speaks comforting words, but he doesn't love me. He's a stranger. He doesn't know me at all, but has only come in to try his skill. What is the consequence? His words run over me like oil upon a slab of marble. They are like the pattering rain upon the rock. They don't break my grief. It stands unmoved as adamant because he has no love for me. However, let someone who loves me as dearly as his own life come and plead with me, and then truly his words are music. 
They taste like honey. He knows the password of the doors of my heart, and my ear is attentive to every word. I catch the intonation of each syllable as it falls, for it is like the harmony of the harps of heaven. Oh, there is a voice in love. It speaks a language all its own. It is an idiom and an accent that none can mimic. Wisdom cannot imitate it. Oratory cannot attain unto it. It is love alone that can reach the mourning heart. Love is the only handkerchief that can wipe the mourner's tears away. Is not the Holy Spirit a loving comforter? Do you know, O saint, how much the Holy Spirit loves you? Can you measure the love of the Spirit? Do you know how great the affection of His soul is toward you? Go and measure heaven. Go and weigh the mountains in the scales. Go and take the ocean's water and count each drop. Go and count the sand upon the sea's wide shore. When you have done all this, you can tell how much He loves you. He has loved you for a long time. He has loved you well. He has always loved you, and He will always love you. Certainly, He is the person to comfort you because He loves. Admit Him then to your heart, O Christian, that He is able to comfort you in your distress. He is a faithful comforter. Love sometimes proves unfaithful. An unfaithful friend is sharper than a serpent's tooth. Oh, far more bitter than the gall of bitterness is to have a friend turn from me in my distress. Oh, woe of woes, to have one who loves me in my prosperity forsake me in the dark day of my trouble. This is sad indeed, but God's Spirit is not like that. He always loves, and loves even to the end. John 13, 1. He is a faithful comforter. Child of God, you are in trouble. A little while ago you found him a sweet and loving comforter. You obtained relief from him when others were only broken cisterns. He sheltered you and carried you in his arms. Oh, why do you distrust him now? Put away your fears, for he is a faithful comforter. Ah, you say, I am afraid that when I am sick I will be deprived of his ordinances. Nevertheless, he will visit you on your sickbed and will sit by your side to give you consolation. Ah, but I have distresses greater than you can conceive of. Wave upon wave rolls over me. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of the Eternal's waterspouts. Psalm 42, 7. Nevertheless, he will be faithful to his promise. Ah, but I have sinned. So you have, but sin cannot sever you from his love. He loves you still. Think not, O poor downcast child of God, that he loves you less because the scars of your old sins have marred your beauty. Oh, no! He loved you when he foreknew your sin. He loved you with a knowledge of what the totality of your wickedness would be, and he does not love you less now. Come to him in all boldness of faith. Tell him that you have grieved him, and he will forget your wandering and will receive you again. The kisses of his love will be bestowed upon you, and the arms of his grace will embrace you. He is faithful. Trust him. He will never deceive you. Trust him. He will never leave you. He is an unwearied comforter. I have sometimes tried to comfort people who have been through trials. You now and then meet with the case of a nervous person. You ask, What is your trouble? You are told, and you try, if possible, to remove it. But while you are preparing your artillery to batter the trouble, you find that it has shifted its quarters and is occupying quite a different position. You change your argument and begin again, but it is gone again, and you are bewildered. You feel like Hercules cutting off the ever-growing heads of the Hydra, and you give up your task in despair. You meet with people whom it is impossible to comfort, reminding us of the man who locked himself up in chains and threw the key away so that nobody could unlock him. I have found some people in the chains of despair. 
Oh, I am the one, they say, who has seen affliction. Pity me, pity me, O oh my friends. The more you try to comfort such people, the worse they get, and therefore, out of all heart, we leave them to wander alone among the tombs of their former joys. However, the Holy Spirit is never out of heart with those whom He wishes to comfort. He attempts to comfort us, and we run away from the sweet salve. He gives some sweet tonic to cure us, and we will not drink it. He gives some wondrous portion to charm away all our troubles, and we put it away from us. Still He pursues us, and although we say that we will not be comforted, He says we will be, and when He has said it, He does it. He is not to be wearied by all our sins or by all our murmurings. He is a wise comforter. Job had comforters, and I think he spoke the truth when he said, Miserable comforters are ye all. Job 16, 2. I dare say, though, that they esteemed themselves wise, and when the young man Elihu rose to speak, they thought he had a world of impudence. Were they not grave and reverend seniors? Did not they comprehend Job's grief and sorrow? If they could not comfort him, who could? But they did not find out the cause. They did not think that he was really a child of God. They thought he was self righteous, and they gave him the wrong medicine. It is a bad situation when the doctor mistakes the disease and gives a wrong prescription, and so perhaps kills the patient. Sometimes when we go and visit people, we mistake their disease and want to comfort them on this point, whereas they do not require any such comfort at all, but they would be better left alone than hurt by such unwise comforters as we are. But oh, how wise the Holy Spirit is! He takes the soul, lays it on the table, and dissects it in a moment. He finds out the root of the matter, he sees where the complaint is, and then he applies the knife where something is required to be taken away, or puts a plaster where the sore is, and he never makes a mistake. Oh, how wise the blessed Holy Spirit is! I turn from every comforter and leave them all, for he alone gives the wisest consolation. He is a safe comforter. All comfort is not safe. Pay attention to that. There is a young man over there, very melancholy. Do you know how he became so? He stepped into the house of God and heard a powerful preacher, and the word was blessed and convinced him of sin. When he went home, his father and the rest found that there was something different about him. Oh, they said, John is mad, he's crazy. What did his mother say? Send him into the country for a week, let him go to the ball or to the theatre. John, did you find any comfort there? No, they made me worse, for while I was there I thought hell might open and swallow me up. Did you find any relief in the entertainment of the world? No, you say, I thought it was an idle waste of time. Alas, this is miserable comfort, but it is the comfort of the people of the world. When a Christian gets into distress, Many will recommend to him this remedy and that remedy. Go and hear Mr. So and so preach. Invite a few friends to your house. Read such and such a book. Very likely it is the most unsafe advice in the world. The devil will sometimes come to people's souls as a false comforter, and he will say to the soul, What need is there to make all this fuss about repentance? You are no worse than other people. He will try to make the soul believe that what is presumption is the real assurance of the Holy Spirit, and so he deceives many by false comfort. There have been many people, like infants, destroyed by elixirs given to lull them to sleep. Many have been ruined by the cry of peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah 6 14. Hearing gentle things when they ought to be stirred to action. Cleopatra's asp was brought in a basket of flowers, and men's ruin often lurks in fair and sweet speeches. However, the Holy Spirit's comfort is safe, and you can rest on it. 
Let him speak the word, and there is a reality about it. Let him give the cup of consolation, and you can drink it to the bottom, for in its depths there is no sediment. There is nothing in it to intoxicate or harm. It is all safe. He is an active comforter. He doesn't comfort by words, but by deeds. Some people comfort by saying, Be ye warmed and filled, yet give nothing. James 2.16. But the Holy Spirit gives. He intercedes with Jesus. He gives us promises. He gives us grace. He comforts us. He is always a successful comforter. He never attempts what he cannot accomplish. He is an ever present comforter. You never have to send for him. Your God is always near you, and when you need comfort in your distress, behold, the Word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. Romans 10 8. He is an ever present help in time of trouble. Psalm 46 1. Chapter 7 The Bruised Reed and Smoking Flax a bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Isaiah 42, 3. Babbling fame always loves to talk of one person or another. There are some whose glory she trumpets forth, and whose honor she extols above the heavens. Some are her favorites, and their names are carved on marble and heard in every land and in every place. Fame is not an impartial judge. She has her favorites. She extols, exalts, and almost deifies some people, while others, whose virtues are far greater, and whose characters are more deserving of commendation, she passes by unheeded, and puts the finger of silence on her lips. You will generally find that those people beloved by fame are men made of brass or iron, and cast in a rough mould. Fame caresses Caesar because he ruled the earth with a rod of iron. Fame loves Martin Luther because he boldly and manfully defied the Pope of Rome, and with knit brow dared to laugh at the thunders of the Vatican. Fame admires John Knox because he was stern and proved himself the bravest of the brave. Generally, you will find her choosing out the men of fire and metal, who stood fearless before their fellow creatures. They were men who were made of courage, who were consolidated lumps of fearlessness, and who never knew what timidity was. However, there is another class of people who are equally virtuous, and are equally to be esteemed, perhaps even more so, whom fame entirely forgets. You do not hear her talk of the gentle-minded Philip Melanchthon. She only says a little about him, yet he likely did as much in the Reformation as even the mighty Luther. You do not hear fame talk much about the sweet and blessed Samuel Rutherford, and of the heavenly words that distilled from his lips, or about Archbishop Leighton, of whom it was said that he was never out of temper in his life. Fame loves the rough granite peaks that defy the storm cloud, but she doesn't care for the more humble stone in the valley on which the weary traveller rests. She wants something bold and prominent, something that courts popularity, something that stands out before the world. She doesn't care for those who retreat in the shadows. It is for this reason that the blessed Jesus, our adorable Master, has escaped fame. No one says much about Jesus except his followers. We don't find his name written among the great and mighty men, although in truth he is the greatest, mightiest, holiest, purest, and best of men who ever lived. However, because he was gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and was emphatically the man whose kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36, because he had nothing rough about him, but was all love, because his words were softer than butter, and his utterances were more gentle in their flow than oil, because never did any man speak as gently as this man. Therefore, 
he is neglected and forgotten. He did not come to conquer with a sword. He did not come like Muhammad with his fiery eloquence. He came to speak with a still, small voice that melts the rocky heart. 1 Kings 19, 12, that binds up the broken in spirit, and that continually says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew 11, 28-29. Jesus Christ was all gentleness, and that's why He has not been extolled among men as otherwise He would have been. Scripture A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. Isaiah 42, 3. The work of God's Holy Spirit begins with bruising. In order to be saved, the fallow ground must be plowed up. The hard heart must be broken. The rock must be split apart. An old clergyman says there is no going to heaven without passing next to the gates of hell without a great deal of soul trouble and heart exercise. I understand the bruised reed to be a picture of the poor sinner when God first begins His operation upon the soul. He is as a bruised reed, almost entirely broken and consumed, and there is only a little strength in him. I understand the smoking flax to be a backsliding Christian, one who has been a burning and a shining light in his day, but by neglect of the means of grace, the withdrawal of God's Spirit, and falling into sin, his light is almost gone out. It has not completely gone out, though. It can never go completely out, for Christ said that he would not quench it. However, it becomes like a lamp when poorly supplied with oil. It is almost useless. It is not extinguished. It smokes. It was once a useful lamp, but now it has become as smoking flax. I think these metaphors very likely describe the contrite sinner as a bruised reed and the backsliding Christian as smoking flax. However, I will not choose to make such a division as that, but I will put both the metaphors together, and I hope we can bring out a few thoughts from them. What in the world is weaker than the bruised reed or the smoking flax? If a duck lands upon a reed that grows in the swamp or marsh, the reed snaps. If a person's foot brushes against it, it is bruised and broken. Every wind that comes howling across the river makes it shake back and forth and nearly tears it up by the roots. You cannot think of anything more frail or brittle, or whose existence depends more upon circumstances than a bruised reed. Then look at smoking flax. What is it? It has a spark within, it's true, but it is almost smothered. An infant's breath could blow it out. The tears of a young girl could quench it in a moment. Nothing has a more precarious existence than the little spark hidden in the smoking flax. You see that weak things are here described. Well, Christ says of them, a bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. Some of God's children, blessed be his name, are made strong to do mighty works for him. God has his Samsons here and there who can pull up Gaza's gates and carry them to the top of the hill. He has here and there his mighty Gideons who can go to the camp of the Midianites and overthrow their armies. He has his mighty men who can go into the pit in winter and slay the lions. However, the majority of his people are a timid, weak race. They are like the starlings that are frightened at every passerby. They are a little, fearful flock. If temptation comes, they fall before it. If trial comes, they are overwhelmed by it. Their frail little boat is danced up and down by every wave. When the wind comes, they are drifted along like a seabird on the crest of the waves. They are weak things, without strength, without force, without might, and without power. Very often I am constrained to say that I would sing 
but cannot. I would pray, but cannot. I would believe, but cannot. You are saying that you cannot do anything. Your best resolves are weak and vain. When you cry, Renew my strength, you feel weaker than before. You are weak, are you? Are you bruised reeds and smoking flax? I am glad you can come in under the name of weak ones, for here is a promise that he will never break nor quench them, but will sustain and hold them up. I have heard of a man who would pick up a pin as he walked along the street on the principle of frugality, but I have never yet heard of a man who would stop to pick up bruised reeds. They are not worth having. Who would care to have a bruised reed, a piece of rush lying on the ground? We all despise it as worthless. And smoking flax, what is the worth of that? It is an offensive and noxious thing, but it is worth nothing. No one would give the snap of a finger for either the bruised reed or the smoking flax. In our estimation, then, there are many of us who are worthless things. There are some people who, if they could weigh themselves in the scales of the sanctuary and put their own hearts into the balance of conscience, would appear to be good for nothing, worthless, useless. There was a time when you thought yourselves to be the very best people in the world, when, if anyone had said that you had more than you deserved, you would have objected and said, I believe I am as good as other people. You thought yourselves something wonderful, that you were extremely worthy of God's love and regard, but now you feel yourselves to be worthless. Sometimes you think that you are such despicable creatures, so worthless and not worth his consideration, that God can hardly know where you are. You can understand how he can look upon a microscopic organism in a drop of water, or upon a grain of dust in the sunbeam, or upon the insect of the summer evening, but you can hardly tell how he can think of you as you consider yourself so worthless, a dead blank in the world, a useless thing. You say, What good am I? I am doing nothing. As for a minister of the gospel, he is of some service. As for a deacon of the church, he is of some use. As for a Sunday school teacher, he is doing some good. But of what service am I? But you could ask the same question here. What is the use of a bruised reed? Can a person lean upon it? Can a person strengthen himself with it? Can it be a pillar in my house? Can you bind it up into the pipes of pan and make music come from a bruised reed? No, it is of no service. And of what use is smoking flax? The midnight traveller cannot be lighted by it. The student cannot read by the flame of it. It is of no use. People throw it into the fire and consume it. Yet that is how you talk of yourselves. You are good for nothing, and so are these things. But Christ will not throw you away, because you are of no value. You do not know of what use you may be, and you cannot tell how Jesus Christ values you after all. There is a good woman, a mother perhaps, who says, Well, I don't often go out. I keep house with my children and seem to be doing no good. Mother, do not say so. Your position is a high, lofty, responsible one, and in training up children for the Lord you are doing as much for His name as the eloquent Apollos, who so valiantly preached the word. Acts 18, 24-28. And you, poor man, all you can do is to work from morning until night and earn just enough to enable you to live day by day. You have nothing to give away, and when you go to the Sunday school you can barely read, and you cannot teach much. Well, but unto him to whom little is given, little is required. Luke 12, 48. Do you not know that there is such a thing as glorifying God by sweeping the street crossing? If two angels were sent down to earth, one to rule an empire, and the other to sweep a street, they would have no choice in the matter as long as God ordered them. God in His providence has called you to work hard for your daily bread. Do it to His glory. Chapter 8 Against the World For this is the love of God, 
that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? 1 John 5, 3-5. We know that there have been great battles where nations have met in strife, and one has overcome the other. But who has read of a victory that overcame the world? Some will say that Alexander was its conqueror, but I answer that he was not. He was himself the vanquished man, even when all things were in his possession. He fought for the world and won it, and then notice how it mastered its master, conquered its conqueror, and lashed the monarch who had been its scourge. See the royal youth weeping and stretching out his hands with senseless cries for another world that he could ravage. In outward show he seemed to have overcome old earth, but in reality, within his inmost soul, the earth had conquered him, had overwhelmed him, had wrapped him in the dream of ambition, and had bound him with the chains of covetousness, so that when he had it all, he was still dissatisfied. Like a poor slave, he was dragged on at the chariot wheels of the world, crying, moaning, and lamenting, because he could not win another. Who is the man who ever overcame the world? Let him come forward. He is a triton among the minnows. He will outshine Caesar. He will outmatch even our own Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, if he can say he has overcome the world. It is such a rare thing, a victory so prodigious, a conquest so tremendous, that he who can claim to have won it may walk among his fellows like Saul, with head and shoulders far above them. 1 Samuel 9, 2. He will command our respect. His very presence will awe us into reverence. His speech will persuade us to obedience. Yielding honor to whom honor is due, we will say when we listen to his voice, "'Tis even as if an angel shook his wings." The Christian overcomes the world. It is a tough battle, not one that the weak and soft might win. It's no easy skirmish that he might win who dashed to battle on some sunny day, looked at the enemy, then turned his horse's rein, and daintily dismounted at the door of his silken tent. It is not a battle that a raw recruit will win, who puts on his uniform and foolishly imagines that one week of service will ensure a crown of glory. No, it is a lifelong war. It is a fight that needs the power of all our muscles and a strong heart. It is a contest that will require all our strength if we are to be triumphant. If we do come off more than conquerors, it will be said of us, as Joseph Hart said of Jesus Christ, he had strength enough and none to spare. It is a battle at which the bravest heart might cower, and it is a fight at which the bravest man might shake, if he did not remember that the Lord is on his side, and therefore whom shall he fear? The Lord is the strength of his life. Of whom shall he be afraid? Psalm 27, 1. This fight with the world is not one of main force or physical might. If it were, we might soon win it. However, it is all the more dangerous from the fact that it is a strife of mind, a contest of heart, a struggle of the spirit, and a strife of the soul. When we overcome the world in one way, we have not even half done our work. For the world is a proteus, changing its shape continually. Like the chameleon, it has all the colors of the rainbow, and when you have gotten the best of the world in one shape, it will attack you in another. Until you die, you will always have fresh appearances of the world to wrestle with. We rebel against the world's customs, and if we do so, what is the conduct of our enemy? She changes her aspect. The world says, That person is a heretic, that one is a fanatic, he is a hypocrite. She grasps her sword, puts frowns upon her brow, scowls like a demon, girds tempests around her, and says, The man dares defy my government. He will not do as others do. Now I will persecute him, slander, come from the depths of hell and hiss at him, envy, 
sharpen up your tooth and bite him. She brings up all false things, and she persecutes the person. If she can, she does it with the hand. If not, then by the tongue. She afflicts him wherever he is. She tries to ruin him in business, or if he stands forth as the champion of the truth, then she laughs, mocks, and scorns. She lets no stone be unturned whereby she can injure him. What then is the behavior of the Lord's warrior when he sees the world take up arms against him, and when he sees all earth, like an army, coming to chase him and utterly destroy him? Does he yield? Does he bend? Does he cringe? Oh, no! Like Luther, he writes, Sedo nulli on his banner. I yield to none. And he goes to war against the world if the world goes to war against him. The true born child of God cares little for man's opinion. Ah, he says, let my bread fail me. Let me be doomed to wander penniless over the wide world. Yes, even let me die. Each drop of blood within these veins belongs to Christ, and I am ready to shed it for his name's sake. He counts all things but loss, so that he may win Christ. Philippians 3 8. That he may be found in him. When the world's thunders roar, he smiles at the uproar while he hums his pleasant tune. When her sword comes out, he looks at it and says, Just as the lightning leaps from its thunder lair, splits the clouds, and frightens the stars, but is powerless against the rock covered mountaineer who smiles at its grandeur, so now the world cannot hurt me, for in the time of trouble my father hides me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle he hides me and sets me up upon a rock. Psalm 27, 5. So we conquer the world by not caring for its displeasure. Well, says the world, I will try another style, and this, believe me, is the most dangerous of all. A smiling world is worse than a frowning one. The world says, I cannot smite the man down with my repeated blows, so I will take off my metal glove, show him a fair white hand, and I'll ask him to kiss it. I will tell him that I love him. I will flatter him, I will speak good words to him. John Bunyan well describes this Madam Bubble. She has a winning way with her. She drops a smile at the end of each of her sentences. She talks much about pleasant things, and she tries to win and gain favor. Oh, believe me, Christians are not as much in danger when they are persecuted as when they are admired. When we stand upon the pinnacle of popularity, we may well tremble and fear. It's not when we are hissed at and ridiculed that we have any cause to be alarmed, but it is when we are pampered on the lap of fortune, when we are nursed upon the knees of the people, and when all people speak well of us, that woe is unto us. It's not in the cold, wintry wind that I take off my coat of righteousness and cast it aside, but it is when the sun comes out, when the weather is warm and the air is balmy, that I unguardedly strip off my robes and become naked. How many people have been made naked by the love of this world! The world has flattered and applauded him. He has drunk the flattery. It was an intoxicating drink. He has staggered, he has reeled, he has sinned, and he has lost his reputation. As a comet that flashes across the sky, wanders far into space, and is lost in darkness, so is he. As great as he was, he falls. As mighty as he was, he wanders and is lost. But the true child of God is never so. He is as safe when the world smiles as when it frowns. He cares as little for her praise as for her disapproval. If he is praised, and it is true, he says, My deeds deserve praise, but I refer all honor to my God. Great souls know what they merit from their critic. To them it is nothing more than the giving of their daily income. Some people cannot live without a large amount of praise, and if they have no more than they deserve, let them have it. If they are children of God, they will be kept steady. They will not be ruined or spoiled, but they will stand with feet like hinds' feet 
upon high places. Psalm 18, 33. Scripture. This is the victory that overcometh the world. 1 John 5, 4. Sometimes the world becomes like a jailer to a Christian. God sends affliction and sorrow until life is a prison house, and the world is its jailer, and a wretched jailer, too. Have you ever been in trials and troubles, my friend? Maybe the world has come to you and said, Poor prisoner, I have a key that will let you out. You are in financial difficulties. I will tell you how you can get free. Put that Mr. Conscience away. He asks you whether it is a dishonest act. Never mind about him. Let him sleep. Think about the honesty after you have the money, and then repent at your leisure. This is what the world says. But you say, I cannot do that thing. Well, says the world, then groan and grumble. A good man like you locked up in this prison. No, says the Christian, my father sent me into need, and in his own time he will bring me out. But if I die here, I will not use any wrong means to escape. My father put me here for my good, and I will not grumble. If my bones must lie here, if my coffin is to be under these stones, if my tombstone will be in the wall of my dungeon, then I will die here rather than so much as lift a finger to get out by dishonest means. Ah, says the world, then you are a fool. The scorner laughs and passes on, saying, The man has no brain. He will not do a bold thing. He has no courage. He will not launch upon the sea. He wants to go in the old beaten path of morality. Yes, so he does, for in this way he overcomes the world. I could tell of battles that have been fought. There have been many poor young women who have worked and worked until their fingers were worn to the bone in order to earn a scanty living out of the things that we wear upon us, not knowing that we often wear the blood, bones, and sinews of poor girls. That poor girl has been tempted a thousand times. The evil one has tried to seduce her, but she has fought a valiant battle. Stern in her integrity, she still stands upright in the midst of poverty, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Song of Solomon 6.10. A heroine, unconquered by the temptations and enticements of sin. In other cases, many men have had the chance of being rich in an hour, and affluent in a moment, if they would only clutch something that they would dare not to consider because God within them said, No. The world said, Be rich, be rich. But the Holy Spirit said, No, be honest, serve your God. Oh, the stern contest and the manly combat carried on within the heart. But they said, No, even if I could have the stars changed into worlds of gold, I would not for those globes of wealth reject my principles and damage my soul. And thus, they walked as a conqueror. Scripture. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 4. Chapter 9. The Divine Refuge. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 46, 1. The children of Israel, while they were in Egypt and in the wilderness, were a type of God's visible church on earth. Moses was speaking primarily of them, but secondarily of all the chosen ones of God in every age. Just as God was the shelter of his ancient people, Israel, so he is the refuge of his saints through all time. First, he was eminently their shelter when they were under bondage and the yoke was heavy. When they had to make bricks without straw, and their taskmasters oppressed them, then the people cried unto the Lord. God heard their cry and sent his servant Moses unto them. In the same way, there often comes a time when people begin to feel the oppression of Satan. I believe that many ungodly people feel the slavery of their position. Even some of those who have never been converted have enough sense to feel at times that the service of Satan is a difficult one, that yields only a little pleasure and involves dreadful risks. 
Some people cannot go on long making bricks without straw, without being more or less conscious that they are in the house of bondage. These who are not God's people are still under the pressure of mind after discovering in part their condition. They then turn to some form of pleasure or self righteousness in order to forget their burden and yoke. God's elect people, however, moved by a higher power, are led to cry unto their God. One of the first signs of a chosen soul is that it seems to know, as if by heavenly instinct, where its true refuge is. You remember that although you only knew a little about Christ, you didn't know much about doctrinal matters, and you didn't even understand your own need. Yet there was something in you that made you pray and caused you to see that you could only find your refuge at the mercy seat. Before you were a Christian, before you could say, Christ is mine, your bedside was a witness to many flowing tears when your aching heart poured itself out before God. You might have cried out something like this, O oh God, I want something. I don't know what it is I want, but I feel a heaviness of spirit. My mind is burdened, and I feel that only you can unburden me. I know that I am a sinner. Oh, that you would forgive me. I hardly understand the plan of salvation, but one thing I know, I want to be saved. I want to arise and go to my Father. My heart longs to find refuge in you. This is one of the first indications that such a soul is one of God's chosen. For it is true, just as it was of Israel in Egypt, that God is the refuge of His people, even when they are under the yoke. When captivity is led captive, the eternal God becomes the refuge of His people from their sins. The Israelites were brought out of Egypt. They were free, although they didn't know where they were marching to, but their chains were snapped. They were emancipated and did not need to call any man master. However, Pharaoh was furious, and he pursued them with his horses and his chariots. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them. Exodus 15, 9. There is also a period in the spiritual life when sin labors to drag back the sinner who has newly escaped from it. Like armies ready for battle, all the poor sinner's past iniquities hurry after him and overtake him in a place where his way is hedged in. The poor fugitive would escape, but he cannot. What then must he do? It was then that Moses cried unto the Lord. When nothing else could be found to give shelter to the poor escaped slaves, when the Red Sea rolled before them, the mountains shut them in on both sides, and an angry foe pursued them, there was one road that was not blocked, and that was the king's highway upward to the throne, the way to their God. Therefore they began at once to travel that road, lifting up their hearts in humble prayer to God, trusting that He would deliver them. You know the story, too, how the uplifted rod divided the watery deeps, how the people passed through the sea as a horse through the wilderness, and how the Lord brought all the hosts of Egypt into the depths of the sea, so that He could utterly destroy them, so that not one of them was left. Those who had seen them one day never saw them again. In this sense, God is still the refuge of His people. Our sins that pursued us so fiercely have been drowned in the depths of the Saviour's blood. They sank to the bottom like stones. The depths have covered them. There is not one, no, not one of them, left, and we, standing upon the shore in safety, can shout in triumph over our drowned sins, Sing unto the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously, and He has cast all our iniquities into the midst of the sea. Compare Exodus 15:21. God is thus the refuge of His people under the yoke of bondage, and when sin seeks to overcome them, He is also their refuge in times of need. The children of Israel journeyed into the wilderness, but there was nothing for them to feed upon there. The arid sand yielded them neither leeks nor garlic nor cucumbers, and no brooks or rivers like the Nile were there to quench their thirst. They would have famished if they had been left to depend upon the natural productions of the soil. 
They came to Mara, where there was a well, but the water was very bitter. At other places where they were, there were no wells at all, and even bitter water was not to be had. What then? The unfailing refuge of God's people in the wilderness was prayer. Moses, their representative, always committed himself to the Most High, at times falling upon his face in agony, and at other times climbing to the top of the hill and there pleading in solemn communion with God that he would deliver the people. You have often heard how the people ate angels' food in the desert, how the Lord rained bread from heaven upon his people in the howling wilderness, and how waters gushed forth from the rock. You have not forgotten how the strong wind blew and brought them meat so that they ate and were satisfied. Israel had no need unsupplied. Their clothing did not wear out, and even though they went through the wilderness, their feet did not become sore. Deuteronomy 8 4. God supplied all their needs. In our land, we must go to the baker, the butcher, the tailor, and many others in order to equip ourselves fully. But the people of Israel went to God for everything. We have to store up our money and buy one thing in one place and another thing in another place. But the eternal God was their refuge and their resort for everything. In every time of need, they had to do nothing but lift up their voice to Him. It is the same way with us spiritually. Faith sees our position today to be just that of the children of Israel then. Whatever our needs are, the eternal God is our refuge. God has promised you that your bread will be given to you and that your water shall be sure. He who meets spiritual needs will not deny physical needs. The mighty Master will never allow you to perish while He has it in His power to help you. Go to Him, no matter what trouble weighs you down. Don't think that your situation is too bad, or nothing is too hard for the Lord. He cares for you in all things. 1 Peter 5 7. You are to give thanks in everything. 1 Thessalonians 5 18. And certainly in everything, by prayer and supplication, you can make your needs known unto God. Philippians 4 6. In times when the jar of oil is ready to fail, and the handful of meal is all but gone, 1 Kings 17 12 14, then go to the all sufficient God, and you will find that those who trust in Him will not lack any good thing. Psalm 34 10. Furthermore, our God is the refuge of His saints when their enemies rage. When the host was passing through the wilderness, they were suddenly attacked by the Amalekites. Unprovoked, these marauders of a desert set upon them and smote many of them. But what did Israel do? The people did not ask to have a strong body of horsemen hired out of the land of Egypt for their refuge, or, even if they did want that, he who was their wiser self, Moses, looked to another arm than that of man, for he cried unto God. How glorious is that picture of Moses with uplifted hands upon the top of the hill giving victory to Joshua in the plain below! Exodus 17, 11. Those uplifted arms were worth ten thousand men to the hosts of Israel. Twice ten thousand would not have obtained a victory as easily as did those two extended arms that brought down omnipotence itself from heaven. Israel's master weapon of war was their confidence in God. Joshua would go forth with men of war, but the Lord, Jehovah Nissi, was the banner of the fight and the giver of the victory. Exodus 17, 15. In the same way, the eternal God is our refuge. When our enemies rage, we do not need to fear their fury. Let us not seek to be without enemies, but let us take our case and spread it before God. We cannot be in such a position that the weapons of our enemies can hurt us while the promise stands good. Scripture No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment you shalt condemn. Isaiah 54 17. Although earth and hell should unite in malice, the eternal God is our castle and stronghold, securing to us an everlasting 
Refuge. Chapter 10. The Use of Chastisement If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Hebrews 12, 7. It is essential to observe the distinction between punishment and chastisement. Punishment and chastisement may agree as to the nature of the suffering. The one suffering may be as great as the other. The sinner who, while he is punished for his guilt, may suffer no more in this life than the Christian who is only chastised by his parent. They do not differ as to the nature of the punishment, but they differ in the mind of the punisher and in the relationship of the person who is punished. God punishes the sinner on his own account because he is angry with the sinner, and his justice must be avenged. His law must be honored, and his commands must have their dignity maintained. However, he does not punish the believer on his own account, but it is on the Christian's account in order to do him good. He afflicts him for his benefit, he lays on the rod for his child's advantage. He has a good purpose toward the person who receives the chastisement. In regard to punishment, the purpose is simply with God for God's glory. In regard to chastisement, the purpose is with the person chastised for his good, for his spiritual profit and benefit. In addition, punishment is laid on a person in anger. God strikes him in wrath. But when he afflicts his child, chastisement is applied in love. All of the afflictions are put there by the hand of love. The rod has been baptized in deep affection before it is laid on the believer's back. God does not afflict willingly, nor grievous for nothing, but He does so out of love and affection. He knows that if He leaves us unchastised, we will bring upon ourselves misery ten thousand times greater than we will suffer by His slight rebukes and the gentle blows of His hand. Scripture The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 5. He is admonishing you, not punishing you. He is correcting you in measure, not smiting you in wrath. There is no angry displeasure in his heart. Even though his brow may be ruffled, there is no anger in him toward you. Even though his eye may have closed upon you, he doesn't hate you. He still loves you. He is not angry with his heritage, for he sees no sin in Jacob or iniquity in Israel. Numbers 23:21 considered in the person of Christ it is simply because he loves you because you are his children that he chastises you why would you complain about the providential dealings of your heavenly father can he treat you more harshly than you deserve consider what a rebel you once were but he has pardoned you certainly if he chooses now to lay the rod upon you you do not need to cry out it was a custom among the Roman emperors of old that when they would set a slave at liberty, they would give him a blow upon the head, and then say, Go free. This blow that your father gives you is a token of your liberty, and do you grumble because he smites you rather strongly? After all, are not his strokes fewer than your crimes and lighter than your guilt? Are you smitten as fiercely as your sins deserve? Consider the corruption that is in your heart, and then you will not wonder that there needs to be so much of the rod to drive it out. Weigh yourself on the scales and discern how much dross is mingled with your gold. And do you think the fire is too hot to purge away as much dross as you have? Why, I think that you do not have the furnace hot enough. There is too much dross and too little fire. The rod is not laid on strict enough, for that proud spirit of yours proves that your heart is not thoroughly sanctified. Although it might be right with God, your words do not sound like it, and your actions do not portray the holiness of your nature. It is the old Adam within you that is groaning. Take heed if you murmur, for it will not go easy with those who complain. 
God always chastises His children twice if they do not bear the first blow patiently. I have often heard a father say, Son, if you cry about that, I will really give you something to cry about. So, if we murmur at a little, God may give us something that will make us cry. If we groan about nothing, He will give us something that will really make us groan. Sit down in patience. Scripture Despise not the chastening of the Lord. Proverbs 3 11. Don't be angry with Him, for He's not angry with you. Don't say that He deals harshly with you. Let humility rise up and speak. Say, It is well, O Lord. You are just in your chastising, for I have sinned. You are righteous in your blows, for I need them to bring me near to you. If you leave me uncorrected and unchastised, I, a poor wanderer, will pass away to the gulf of death and sink into the pit of eternal perdition. That is the first sense in which we can despise the chastening of the Lord. We can murmur under it. There are certain things that happen to us in life that we immediately attribute to the providence of God. If a grandfather of ours would die and leave us a few thousand dollars, what a merciful providence that would be! If by something strange in business we were suddenly to accumulate a fortune, that would be a blessed providence. If an accident happens and we are kept safe and our limbs are not hurt, that is always a providence. But suppose we were to lose a few thousand dollars, would not that be a providence? Suppose our establishment would break up and our business would fail, would not that be a providence? Suppose we would break our leg during an accident, would not that be a providence? This is the difficulty. It is always a providence when it's a good thing, but why is it not a providence when it doesn't happen to be just as we please? Surely it is so, for if the one thing is ordered by God, so is the other. It is written, I form the light and create darkness, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Isaiah 45, 7. I question whether that is not despising the chastening of the Lord when we set a prosperous providence before an adverse one, for I do think that an adverse providence should be the cause of as much thankfulness as a prosperous one. If it is not, we are violating the command, In everything give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Instead, we say, Of what use will this trial be to me? I don't see how it can possibly be useful to my soul. I was growing in grace just now, but there is something that has damped all my passion and has overthrown my zeal. I was just on the Mount of Assurance, and God has brought me to the Valley of Humiliation. Can that be any good to me? A few weeks ago I had wealth, and I distributed it in the cause of God. Now I have none. What can be the use of that? All these things are against me. You are despising the chastening of the Lord when you say it is of no use. No child thinks that the rod is of much benefit. In his opinion, anything in the house is of more use than that rod. If you were to ask the child which of the household items could be done away with, he would want to keep the chairs, tables, and everything else except the rod of correction. He doesn't think it does any good whatsoever. He despises the rod, and so do we. We don't think it can benefit us. We want to get rid of the rod and turn it away. Scripture, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Proverbs 3, 11. Let me show you how wrong you are. Does your ignorance cause you to say that God is unwise? I thought it was written that he was too wise to err, and I thought that you believed that he was too good to be unkind. Does your little wisdom claim for itself the chair of honor? Doth your finite knowledge stand up before your Maker and tell him he is unwise in what he does? Will you dare to say that one of his purposes will be unfulfilled and that he does an unwise act? If so, if you will speak this way, then you are recklessly arrogant and ignorant. Do not say such things, 
but bend meekly down before his superior wisdom and say, O God, I believe that in the darkness you are brewing light, that in the storm clouds you are gathering sunshine, that in the deep mines you are fashioning diamonds, and that in the beds of the sea you are making pearls. I believe that however unfathomable your designs may be, they have a bottom. Though it is in the whirlwind and in the storm, you have a way, and that way is good and righteous altogether. I would not have you alter one atom of your plan. It will be just as you desire. I bow before you, and I give my ignorance the word to hold its tongue, and to be silenced while your wisdom speaks words of right. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord by thinking that it can be of no possible service to you. Many people have been corrected by God when that correction has been in vain. I have known Christians who have committed some sin, and God, by the rod, has shown them the evil of that sin. They have been smitten and have seen the sin, but never afterward corrected it. That is, despising the chastening of the Lord. When a father chastises a son for anything he has done, and the boy immediately does it again, it shows that he despises his father's chastening. In the same way, we have seen Christians who have had errors in their lives, and God has chastened them because of it, but they have done it again. You will remember a man named Eli in the Bible. God chastened him once when he sent Samuel to tell him dreadful news that because he had not reproved his children, those children would be destroyed. 1 Samuel 3, 12-14. But Eli continued the same as ever. He despised the chastening of the Lord, although his ears were made to tingle, and in a little while God did something else for him. His sons were taken away, and then it was too late to fix things, for the children were gone. When he had the opportunity to reform, his character had passed away. How many of you get chastened by God and do not hear the rod? There are many deaf souls who do not hear God's rod. Many Christians are blind and cannot see God's purposes, and when God would take some foolishness out of them, the foolishness is held on to. Not every affliction benefits the Christian, but only a sanctified affliction does. Not every trial purifies an air of light but only a trial that God Himself sanctifies by His grace. Take heed if God is trying you. Be sure to search and find out the reason. Are the consolations of God small with you? There is some reason for it. Have you lost that joy you once felt? There is some cause for it. Many people would not suffer half as much if they would only look to the cause of the suffering. I have sometimes walked a mile or two, almost limping along because there was a stone in my shoe, and I did not stop to look for it. Many Christians go limping for years because of the stones in their shoes, but if they would only stop to look for them, they would find relief. What is the sin that is causing you pain? Get it out and take away the sin, for if you don't, you have not regarded this admonition that speaks to you as unto sons my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Chapter 11 Ministers and Success We are unto God a sweet savour of Christ, as well in them that perish as in them that are saved. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 The minister is not responsible for his success. He is, though, responsible for what he preaches. He is accountable for his life and actions, but he is not responsible for other people. If I simply preach God's word, even if there were never a soul saved, the king would say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, 23. If I only tell my message, even if no one would listen to it, he would say, You have fought the good fight. Receive your crown. 2 Timothy 4 7 8. You hear the words of the text. We are unto God a sweet savour of Christ, as well in them that perish as in them that are saved. 
2 Corinthians 2.15. This will appear clear if I just tell you what a gospel minister is called in the Bible. Sometimes he is called an ambassador. For what is an ambassador responsible? He goes to a country as a representative. He carries terms of peace to the conference. He uses all his talents for his master. He tries to show that the war is contrary to the prosperity of the different countries. He attempts to bring about peace, but the other kings rashly refuse it. When he comes home, his master asks, Why did you not make peace? Why, my lord? he would say. I told them the terms, but they said nothing. Well then, he will say, you have done your duty. I am not going to condemn you if the war continues. The minister of the gospel is also called a fisherman. A fisherman is not responsible for the quantity of fish he catches, but for the way he fishes. That is a mercy for some ministers, I am sure, for they have neither caught fish nor even attracted any around their nets. They have been spending all their life fishing with most elegant silk lines and gold and silver hooks. They always use nicely polished phrases, but the fish will not bite for all that, whereas we of a rougher order have put the hook into the jaws of hundreds. However, if we cast the gospel net in the right place, even if we don't catch anything, the master will find no fault with us. He will say, Fisherman, did you labor? Did you throw the net into the sea in the time of storms? Yes, my lord, I did. What have you caught? Only one or two. Well, I could have sent you a school of fish, if it so pleased me. It's not your fault. I give in my sovereignty where I please, and I withhold when I choose. As for you, you have well labored. Therefore, there is your reward. Sometimes the minister is called a sower. No farmer expects a sower to be responsible for the harvest. All he is responsible for is sowing the seed. Does he sow the right seed? If he scatters it on good soil, then he is happy. But if it falls by the wayside and the fowls of the air devour it, who will blame the sower? Could he help it? No, for he did his duty. He scattered the seed over a broad area and there he left it. Who is to blame? Certainly not the sower. If a minister comes to heaven with only one sheaf of grain on his shoulder, his master will say, O reaper, once a sower, where did you gather your sheaf? My lord, I sowed upon the rock, and it would not grow. Only one seed on a chance Sunday morning was blown a little way by the wind, and it fell upon a prepared heart, and this is my one sheaf. Hallelujah! the angelic choirs resound. One sheaf from a rock is more honor to God than a thousand sheaves from good soil. Therefore, let him take his seat as near the throne as that man over there who, stooping beneath his many sheaves, comes from some fertile land, bringing his sheaves with him. I believe that if there are degrees in glory, they will not be in proportion to success, but in proportion to the earnestness of our endeavors. If we have the right intentions, and if as ministers we strive to do the right thing with all our hearts, even if we never see any effect, we will still receive the crown. But much more happy will be the person who has it said about him in heaven, He shines forever because he was wise and won many souls unto righteousness. It is always my greatest joy to believe that if I would enter heaven, I will in future days see heaven's gates open, and in will come someone who, looking me in the face, will smilingly move along to God's throne and there bow down before him. Then, when he has paid his homage and his adoration, he will come to me, and although unknown, will clasp my hand. If there were tears in heaven, surely I would weep, and he would say, Brother, from your lips I heard the word. Your voice first admonished me of my sin. Here I am, and you were the instrument of my salvation. As the gates open, one after another, the ransomed souls will come in, and for each one of these a star, another gem in the diadem of glory. Each one of them brings another honor, 
and another note in the song of praise. Blessed are those who shall die in the Lord, and their works will follow them. For that is what the Spirit says. Revelation 14, 13. What will become of some good Christians if crowns in heaven are measured in value by the souls that are saved? Some of you will have a crown in heaven without a single star in it. I recently read an article about the starless crown in heaven, a man in heaven with a crown without a star. Not one person saved by him. He will sit in heaven as happy as he can be, for sovereign mercy saved him. But oh, to be in heaven without a single star! Mother, what do you say to be in heaven without one of your children to deck your brow with a star? Minister, what would you say to be a polished preacher and yet have no star? Writer, will it speak well of you to have written even as gloriously as John Milton if you are found in heaven without a star? I am afraid we pay too little regard to this. People will sit down and write huge books and volumes so that they can have them put in libraries forever and have their names handed down by fame. But how few are looking to win stars forever in heaven! Toil on, child of God, toil on! For if you want to serve God, your bread cast upon the waters will be found after many days. Ecclesiastes 11 1. If you send in the feet of the ox, you will reap a glorious harvest in that day when he comes to gather in his elect. The minister is not responsible for his success. However, to preach the gospel is high and solemn work. The minister has been very often degraded into a trade. In these days, men are taken and made into ministers who would have made good captains at sea, or who could have waited well at the counter, but who were never intended for the pulpit. They are selected by man. They are crammed with literature and are educated up to a certain point. They graduate, and people call them ministers. I wish every one of them success, for as good Joseph Irons used to say, God be with many of them, even if it is only to make them hold their tongues. Man made ministers are of no use in this world, and the sooner we get rid of them, the better. Their way is this they prepare their sermons very carefully, then read it on Sunday most sweetly in a pleasant voice, and so the people go away pleased. But that is not God's way of preaching. If so, I am sufficient to preach forever. I can buy printed sermons for a few dollars that is to say, provided they have been preached fifty times before. They cost more if they have not been preached before. But that's not the way. Preaching God's Word is not, as some seem to think, mere child's play, a mere business or trade to be taken up by anyone. A man ought to feel first that he has a solemn call to it by God. Next, he should know that he really possesses the Spirit of God, and that when he speaks there is an influence upon him that enables him to speak as God would have him speak. Otherwise, he should immediately leave the pulpit. He has no right to be there, even if the ministry is on his own property. He has not been called to preach God's truth, and unto him God says, What have you to do to declare my statutes? Psalm fifty sixteen. What is difficult about preaching God's gospel? Well, it must be somewhat hard, for Paul said, Who is sufficient for these things? 2 Corinthians 2.16. I will tell you first that it is difficult, because it is so difficult not to be warped by your own prejudices in preaching the word. You want to say a stern thing, and your heart says, Master, in so doing you will condemn yourself, and the temptation is not to say it. Romans 2.1. Another trial is that you are afraid of displeasing the rich in your congregations. You think, if I say such and such a thing, so and so will be offended. He doesn't approve of that doctrine. I'd better leave it out. Maybe you will happen to win the applause of the multitude, and you must not say anything that will displease them, for if they cry, Hosanna, today, they will cry, Crucify, Crucify, tomorrow. 
All these things work on a minister's heart. He is a man, and he feels it. Then comes the sharp knife of criticism, along with the arrows of those who hate him and hate his Lord. He cannot help feeling it sometimes. He can put on his armor and cry, I don't care about your malice. But there were times when the archers sorely wounded even Joseph. Then he stands in another danger and wants to come out and defend himself, for whoever tries to do so is a great fool. He who lets his detractors alone, and like the eagle does not care about the chattering of the sparrows, or like the lion will not turn aside to rend the snarling jackal, he is the man, and he will be honored. However, the danger is that we want to set ourselves right. Oh, who is sufficient to steer clear from these rocks of danger? Scripture? Who is sufficient for these things? To stand up and to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. Ephesians 3 8. Sunday after Sunday, and weekday after weekday. Chapter 12 Seasons of Darkness. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Isaiah 26 9. Night appears to be a time especially favorable to devotion. Its solemn stillness helps to free the mind from that perpetual commotion that the cares of the world will bring around it, and the stars looking down from heaven upon us shine as if they would attract us up to God. I don't know how you may be affected by the solemnities of midnight, but when I have sat alone meditating on the great God and the mighty universe, I have felt that indeed I could worship Him, for night seemed to be spread abroad as a very temple for adoration, while the moon walked as high priest amid the stars, the worshippers. I joined in that silent song that they sang unto God. You are great, O God, your works are great. Scripture, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou have ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Psalm 8, 3-4. I find that this sense of the power of midnight not only acts upon religious men, but there is a certain poet whose character I think I could hardly disapprove of too much a man very far from understanding true Christianity, one whom I may, I suppose, justly call an atheist, a reprobate of the worst order. And yet, he says concerning night in one of his poems, "'Tis midnight on the mountains brown, the cold round moon shines deeply down. Blue roll the waters, blue the sky, spreads like an ocean hung on high. Bespangled with those isles of light, so wildly, spiritually bright. Whoever gazed upon them shining, and turned to earth without repining, nor wished for wings to flee away and mix with their eternal ray. Even with the most irreligious person, someone farthest from spiritual thought, it seems that there is some power in the grandeur and stillness of night to draw him up to God. I trust many of us can say with David, I have thought upon you continually. I have meditated upon your name in the night watches, and with desire have I desired your presence in the night. Psalm 63, 6. The Christian does not always have a bright shining sun. He has seasons of darkness and of night. It's true that it is written in God's word, Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Proverbs 3.17, and it is a great truth that religion, the true religion of the living God, is calculated to give a person happiness below as well as bliss above. However, experience tells us that if the course of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day, Proverbs 4.18, yet sometimes that light is eclipsed. At certain periods, Clouds and darkness cover the sun, and he beholds no clear shining of the daylight, but walks in darkness and sees no light. There are many people who have rejoiced in the presence of God for a season. They have basked in the sunshine God has been pleased to give them in the earlier stages of their Christian career. 
they have walked along the green pastures by the side of the still waters. Psalm 23, 2. And suddenly, in a month or two, they find that the glorious sky is clouded. Instead of green pastures, they have to tread the sandy desert. In the place of still waters, they find streams disagreeable to their taste and bitter to their spirits. And they say, Surely, if I were a child of God, this would not happen. Oh, do not say so, you who are walking in darkness. Even the best of God's saints have their nights. The dearest of his children have to walk through a weary wilderness. There is not a Christian who has enjoyed perpetual happiness. There is no believer who can always sing a song of joy. Not every lark can always carol. Not every star can always be seen. Not every Christian is always happy. Perhaps the King of Saints gave you a season of great joy at first because you were a raw recruit, and he would not put you into the roughest part of the battle when you had first enlisted. You were a tender plant, and he nursed you in the greenhouse until you could stand severe weather. You were a young child, and therefore he wrapped you in the softest blankets. But now you have become strong, and the case is different. Capuan holidays do not suit Roman soldiers, and they would not agree with Christians. We need clouds and darkness to exercise our faith, to cut off self dependence and make us put more faith in Christ and less in evidence, less in experience, and less in frames and feelings. The best of God's children, I repeat it again for the comfort of those who are suffering depression of spirits, have their nights. Sometimes it is a night over the whole church at once. There are times when Zion is under a cloud, when the whole fine gold becomes dim and the glory of Zion is departed. There are seasons when we do not hear the clear preaching of the word, when the doctrines are withheld, when the glory of the Lord God of Jacob is dim, when his name is not exalted, and when the traditions of men are taught instead of the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. In such a season, the whole church is dark. Of course, each Christian participates in it. He goes about and weeps and cries, as in Isaiah 56 10, O God, how long will poor Zion be depressed? How long will her shepherds be dumb dogs that cannot bark? Will her watchmen always be blind? Will the silver trumpet sound no more? Will not the voice of the gospel be heard in her streets? Oh, there are seasons of darkness to the entire church. May God grant that we may not have to pass through another, but that starting from this period, the sun may rise never to set, until, like a sea of glory, the light of brilliance will spread from pole to pole. At other times, this darkness over the soul of the Christian rises from worldly distresses. He may have had a misfortune, as it is called. Maybe something has gone wrong in his business, or an enemy has done something against him. Maybe death has struck down a child, or bereavement has snatched away the darling of his heart. Perhaps the crops have failed, or the winds refuse to bear his ships homeward, and one vessel strikes a rock while another is broken apart. Everything seems to go wrong at once, and like one gentleman who called to see me, he may be able to say, Sir, I prospered far more when I was a worldly man than I have done since I have become a Christian for since then everything has appeared to go wrong with me. I thought that religion had the promise of this life as well as of that which is to come. I told him that Christianity did indeed have that promise in this life and in the next, but he must remember that there was one great legacy that Christ left his people, and I was glad he had come in for a share of it. In the world you will have tribulation, but in me you will have peace. John 16:33. Yes, you might be troubled about this. You might be saying, Look at so and so, see how he spreads himself like a green flourishing tree. He is an extortioner and a wicked man, yet everything he does prospers. You may even observe his death and say, He had no pains in his death. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Psalm 73 4 5. God has set them in slippery places 
but he cast them down to destruction. Psalm 73, 18. It is better to have a Christian's days of sorrow than a worldling's days of mirth. It is better to have a Christian's sorrows than a worldling's joys. It is happier to be chained in a dungeon with a Paul than to reign in the palace with an Ahab. It is better to be a child of God in poverty than a child of Satan in riches. Cheer up, then, you downcast spirit, if this is your trial. Remember that many saints have passed through the same, and the best and most eminent believers have had their nights. Christians very frequently have their nights, but a Christian's religion will keep its color in the night. Scripture With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Isaiah 26 9. What a great deal of silver slipper religion we have in this world! People will follow Christ when everyone cries, Hosanna, Hosanna! The multitude will crowd around the man then, and they will take him by force and make him a king when the sun shines and when the soft wind blows. They are like the plants upon the rock, which sprang up and for a little while were green, but when the sun had risen with fervent heat, they immediately withered away. Demas, 2 Timothy 4.10, Mr. Hold the World, from Pilgrim's Progress, and a great many others are very pious people in easy times. They will always go with Christ by daylight, and will keep in company as long as fashion gives religion the doubtful benefit of its support, but they will not go with Him in the night. There are some things whose color you can only see by daylight. And there are many who profess to follow Christ who only do so in the daylight. If they were in the night of trouble and persecutions, you would find that there was very little in them. They are good by daylight, but they are bad by night. Do you not know that the best test of a Christian is the night? The nightingale, if she would sing by day when every goose is cackling, would be considered no better a musician than the wren. It has its glory in the night. If a Christian only remained steadfast by daylight, when every coward is bold, what would he be? There would be no beauty in his courage, no glory in his bravery. However, his sincerity is proven because he can sing at night. He can sing in trouble, and he can sing when he is driven nearly to despair. The stars are not visible by daylight, but they become apparent. When the sun is set. There are very many Christians whose piety did not burn much when they were in prosperity, but it will be known in adversity. I have noticed it in some of my brethren when they were in deep trial. I had not heard them talk much about Christ before, but when God's hand robbed them of their comfort, I remember that I could see their Christianity infinitely better than I could before. Nothing can bring our religion out better than that. Grind the diamond a little, and you will see it glisten. Only let a Christian have a little trouble, and his endurance through that trouble will prove him to be of the true seed of Israel. All that the Christian wants in the night is his God. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. By day there are many things that a Christian will desire besides his Lord, but in the night he wants nothing but his God. I cannot understand how it is, unless it is to be accounted for by the corruption of our spirit, that, when everything goes well with us, we are setting our affection first on this object, and then on another, and then on another. And that desire that is as insatiable as death, and as deep as hell, never rests satisfied. We are always wanting something, always desiring something more. However, if you place a Christian in difficulty, you will find that he does not want gold then, and he does not want carnal honor. He then wants his God. I suppose he is like the sailor when he sails along smoothly and has fair weather, and wants this and that to amuse himself with on deck. But when the winds blow, all that he wants is the haven. He does not desire anything else. The biscuit may be moldy, but he doesn't care. The water may be bitter, but he doesn't care. He doesn't think of it in the storm. 
He only thinks about the haven, then. That is how it is with the Christian. When he is going along smoothly, he wants this and that comfort. He is pursuing this position or is wanting to obtain this and that promotion. But let him once doubt his interest in Christ, let him once get into some distress of soul and trouble so that it is very dark, and all he will feel then is, With my soul have I desired thee in the night. When the child is put upstairs to bed, he may lie while the light is there and look at the trees that shake against the window and admire the stars that are coming out. But when it gets dark and the child is still awake, he cries for his parents. He cannot be content with anything else. In the same way, in daylight, the Christian will look at anything. He will cast his eyes around on this pleasure and on that. But when the darkness gathers, it is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Psalm 22, 1. Chapter 13 Lacking Joy and Peace be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, 5. There are many people who profess to have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but who assert that they have no joy and peace as a result of that belief. They don't make this profession by union with the Christian church or in any open manner, but when they are pressed about the matter of personal salvation, they will sometimes tell us, I do believe in Christ, but still I am so unhappy and miserable that I cannot believe that I am saved. They basically are saying that they know that the Word of God declares that whosoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, John 3, 18, but they say that they have believed in Jesus, yet are still haunted with fears of condemnation that lead them to believe that they have not been delivered from the wrath to come. I speak to tender hearts, or to those who desire to have tender hearts. I speak to those who have their faces toward Jerusalem, though as yet they are traveling in the dark. If you really desire to obtain joy and peace through believing, we trust that God may bless you to obtain it. While valuing joy and peace, take care that you do not overestimate them. Remember that although joy and peace are eminently desirable, they are not infallible evidences of safety. There are many people who have great joy and much peace who are not saved, for their joy springs from a mistake, and their peace is the false peace that rests upon the sand of their own imaginations rather than upon the rock of divine truth. It is certainly a good sign that spring is come, that you find the weather to be so warm but there are very mild days in winter. I must not therefore infer that because the heat of the sun is at such and such a degree, therefore it is necessarily spring. On the other hand, we have cold days that, if we had to judge by such evidences, might indicate that we were in November rather than May. And so joy and peace are like fine sunny days. They come to those who have no faith, who are in the winter of their unbelief, and they may not visit you who have believed. If they do come, they may not abide, for there may be cold weather in May, and there may be some sorrow and some distress of mind even to a truly believing soul. Therefore, understand that you must not look upon the possession of joy and peace as being the absolutely necessary consequence of your being saved. A man may be in the lifeboat, but that lifeboat may be so tossed about that he may still feel himself exceedingly ill and consider himself to be still in danger. It is not his sense of safety that makes him safe, for he is safe because he is in the lifeboat, whether he is sensible of this or not. Understand then that joy and peace are not infallible or indispensable evidences of safety, and they certainly are not unchanging evidences. The brightest Christians lose their joy, and some of those who stand well in the things of God and concerning whom you would have no doubt entertain a great many suspicions about themselves. 
Joy and peace are the elements of a Christian, but he is sometimes out of his element. Joy and peace are usually found in him, but there are times when, with fightings within and wars without, 2 Corinthians 7 5, his joy departs and his peace is broken. The leaves on the tree prove that the tree is alive, but the absence of leaves will not prove that the tree is dead. True joy and peace may be very satisfactory evidences, but the absence of joy and peace during certain seasons can often be accounted for on some other hypothesis than that of there being no faith within. To trust Christ because you just feel happy is irrational. Now suppose someone should have said during the last financial panic, I feel sure that the bank my money is in is safe. Why? Because I feel so easy about my money. Anybody would say to him, That's no reason. Suppose he said, I feel sure that my money is safe. And you had said, What is the reason? Because I believe the bank is safe. Oh, you say, That is right enough. That is a good reason. In the first case, you put the effect in the place of the cause and try to make that a cause, but you can't do that. Maybe someone would say, I have got a large estate in India. How do you know? Because I feel so happy in thinking about it. Why, you fool, you say, that's no proof whatsoever, not the slightest. But if he says to you, I feel very happy, and you ask him why, and he replies, Because I have got an estate in India, you might consider that a good reason. A person may be thankful for that which he rightly possesses, but to make joy and peace the evidence of facts from without is supremely ridiculous. For someone to say, I know I am saved because I am happy, is most irrational, while to be happy because you are saved is proper enough. Oh, I pray, take care that you do not act irrationally before God in this way. Here's another example. Suppose that I am in fear about the health of some dear friend. Well, I say, I would like to have my friend healthy, but I want to feel myself safe about that friend. I don't know anything about the state of my friend just now, and I am uneasy. If I could feel at ease, then I would be convinced that my friend was well. You would justly reply, There is no connection between the two things. The proper mode of procedure is to try and find out whether your friend is well, and then you will feel at ease. However, you now say, I would believe I was saved if I felt happy. Is there any reason in that? On the contrary. First of all, believe that you are saved, and then happiness will come of it. You cannot believe that you are saved while you persist in doing what God does not tell you to do, that is, to look to your own joy and peace instead of looking to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Christian men and women are only men and women, and they may have a bad liver or a gallstone attack or some trial, and then they get depressed if they have ever so much grace. I would defy the Apostle Paul himself to help it. But what then? Then you can get joy and peace through believing. I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to, but I always get back again by this. I know that I trust Christ. I have no reliance except in Him, and if He falls, I will fall with Him. But if He does not fall, I will not fall. Because He lives, I will live also and I spring to my legs again and fight with my depressions of spirit and my melancholy, and I get the victory through it. You can do so, too, and you must, for there is no other way of escaping from it. In your most depressed seasons, you are to get joy and peace through believing. Ah, someone says, but suppose you have fallen into some great sin, what then? That is even more reason for you to cast yourself upon him. Do you think that Jesus Christ is only for little sinners? Is he a doctor who only heals finger aches? It is not faith to trust Christ when I do not have any sin, 
but it is true faith when I am heinous and vile and filthy. When I have messed up and have fallen during the day, and have done serious damage to my joy and peace, I can go back again to that dear fountain and say, Lord, I never loved washing as much before as I do tonight, for today I have made a fool of myself. I have said and done what I should not have done, and I am ashamed and full of confusion. But I believe that Christ can save me, even me, and I will rest in Him still. Chapter 14 Mr. Ready to Halt and His Companions If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed. Matthew 17, 20 When faith first begins in the soul, it is like a grain of mustard seed, of which the Saviour said it was the least of all seeds. Then, as God the Holy Spirit is pleased to water it with the sacred moisture of His grace, it germinates and grows and begins to spread, until at last it becomes a great tree. To use another example, when faith begins in the soul, it is simply looking unto Jesus, and perhaps even then there are so many clouds of doubt and so much dimness of the eye that we have need for the light of the Spirit to shine upon the cross before we are able even to so much as see it. When faith grows a little, it rises from looking to Christ to coming to Christ. He who stands afar off and looks to the cross gains courage in time, and, finding courage, he runs up to the cross. Or maybe he doesn't run, but has to be drawn before he can so much as crawl there, and even then it is with a limp that he draws near to Christ the Saviour. But, having done that, faith goes a little farther. It lays hold on Christ. It begins to see Him in His excellency appropriates Him in some degree, conceives Him to be a real Christ and a real Saviour, and is convinced of His suitability. When it has done that much, it goes even farther. It leans on Christ. It leans on its Beloved. It casts all the burden of its cares, sorrows, and griefs upon that blessed shoulder, and permits all its sins to be swallowed up in the great Red Sea of the Saviour's blood. Faith can go farther still, for having seen and having run toward him, having laid hold upon him, and having leaned upon him, faith next puts in a humble but a sure and certain claim to all that Christ is and all that he has done. Then, trusting in this alone, appropriating all this to itself, faith rises to full assurance, and outside of heaven there is no condition more joyful and blessed. However, faith is only very small, and there are some Christians who never get out of little faith the entire time they are here. You notice in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress how many little faiths he mentions. There is our old friend Ready to Halt, who went all the way to the celestial city on crutches, but left them when he went into the river Jordan. Then there is little Feeble Mind, who carried his feeble mind with him all the way to the banks of the river and then left it, ordering it to be buried in a dunghill so that no one could inherit it. Then there is Mr. Fearing, who used to stumble over a straw and was always frightened if he saw a drop of rain because he thought the floods of heaven were let loose upon him. You might remember Mr. Despondency and Miss Much Afraid, who were so long locked up in the dungeon of giant despair that they were almost starved to death, and there was little left of them but skin and bone. Then there was poor Mr. Feeblemind, who had been taken into the cave of giant Slaygood, who was about to eat him when Greatheart came to his deliverance. John Bunyan was a very wise man. He has put a great many of those characters in his book because there are a great many of them. He has not left us with one Mr. Ready to Halt, but he has given us seven or eight specific characters because he himself in his own time had been one of them, and he had known many others who had walked in the same path. Little faith is just as sure of heaven as great faith. When Jesus Christ counts up his jewels at the last day, he will take to himself the little pearls as well as the great ones. 
If a diamond is never so small, it is still precious because it is a diamond. So will faith be, no matter how small, if it is true faith. Christ will never lose even the smallest jewel of his crown. Little faith is always sure of heaven because the name of little faith is in the book of eternal life. Little faith was chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Little faith was bought with the blood of Christ, and he cost just as much as great faith. For every man a shekel was the price of redemption. Every man, whether great or small, prince or peasant, had to redeem himself with a shekel. Christ has bought all, both little and great, with the same most precious blood. Little faith is always sure of heaven, for God has begun the good work in him, and he will carry it on. God loves him, and he will love him unto the end. God has provided a crown for him, and he will not allow the crown to hang there without a head. He has erected for him a mansion in heaven. And he will not allow the mansion to stand unoccupied forever. Little faith is always safe, but he very seldom knows it. He is sometimes afraid of hell. He is very often afraid that the wrath of God abides on him. He will tell you that the country on the other side of the flood can never belong to a worm as low as he is. Sometimes it is because he feels himself so unworthy. And another time it is because the things of God are too good to be true, he says, or he cannot think they can be true to someone like him. Sometimes he is afraid that he is not elect. Another time he fears that he has not been called in the right way, and that he has not come to Christ properly. Another time his fears are that he will not hold on to the end, that he will not be able to persevere. If you kill a thousand of his fears, he is sure to have many more by tomorrow, for unbelief is one of those things that you cannot destroy. It has, says Bunyan, as many lives as a cat. You can kill it over and over again, but it still lives. It is one of those strong weeds that sleep in the soil even after it has burned, and it only needs a little encouragement to grow again. Great faith, though, is sure of heaven, and he knows it. He climbs Mount Pisgah's top and views the landscape over. He drinks in the mysteries of paradise even before he enters within the pearly gates. He sees the streets that are paved with gold. He beholds the walls of the city, the foundations whereof are precious stones. He hears the mystic music of the glorified and begins to smell on earth the perfumes of heaven. However, poor little faith can hardly look at the sun. He very seldom sees the light. He gropes in the valley, and while all is safe, he always thinks himself unsafe. Strong faith can well dispute with the enemy. Satan comes along and says, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Matthew 4 9. No, we say, you cannot give us all these things, for they are ours already. No, he says, but you are poor, naked, and miserable. True, we say to him, but still these things are ours, and it is good for us to be poor and without earthly goods, or else our Father would give them to us. Oh, says Satan, you deceive yourselves. You have no portion in these things, but if you will serve me, I will make you rich and happy here. Strong faith says, Serve you, you fiend, go away. Do you offer me silver? God gives me gold. Do you say to me, I will give you this if you disobey? Fool that you are! I have a thousand times as great wages for my obedience as you can offer for my disobedience. But when Satan meets little faith, he says to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Matthew 4 6. And poor little faith is so afraid that he is not a Son of God that he is very inclined to cast himself down at the idea. There, says Satan, I will give you all this if you will disobey. Little Faith says, I am not quite sure that I am a child of God and that I have a portion among those who are sanctified. And he is very inclined to fall into sin by reason of the littleness of his faith. Yet at the same time, I must observe that I have seen some little faiths 
who are far less likely to fall into sin than others. They have been so cautious that they dared not put one foot before the other because they were afraid they would take a wrong step. They hardly even dared to open their lips, but they prayed, O Lord, open thou my lips. Psalm 51 15. Afraid that they would let a wrong word out if they were to speak. They have a very tender conscience and are always afraid that they will fall into sin unconsciously. Well, I like people who are like that. I have sometimes thought that little faith stays nearer to Christ than any other. A person who is very near drowning is sure to hold the plank all the tighter with the grasp of a drowning man, which tightens and becomes more clenched the more his hope is decreased. Little faith may be kept from falling, but this is the fruit of tender conscience and not of little faith. Careful walking is not the result of little faith. It might go with it, and so might keep little faith from perishing, but little faith is in itself a dangerous thing, laying us open to innumerable temptations and taking away very much of our strength to resist them. Scripture The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8.10 And if that joy ceases, you become weak and very inclined to turn aside. Little faiths have many nights and few days, very long winters and very short summers, and many screams but very little shouting. They often play upon the pipe mourning, but very seldom sound the trumpet in exultation. Maybe the only way in which most people get their faith increased is by great trouble. We don't grow strong in faith on sunshine days. It's only in strong weather that a person gets faith. Faith is not an attainment that drops like the gentle dew from heaven. It generally comes in the whirlwind and the storm. Look at the old oaks. How is it that they have become so deeply rooted in the earth? Ask the March winds, and they will tell you. It's not the April showers that did it, or the sweet May sunshine, but it was March's rough wind. The blustering month of the north winds shook the tree to and fro and caused the roots to bind themselves around the rocks. So must it be with us. We don't make great soldiers in the barracks at home. Great soldiers must be made amid flying bullets and thundering cannons. We cannot expect to make good sailors on the Serpentine Lake. Good sailors must be made far away on the deep sea, where the wild winds howl and the thunders roll like drums in the march of the God of Armies. Storms and tempests are the things that make men tough and rugged mariners. They see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. So it is with Christians. Great faith must have great trials. Mr. Greatheart would never have been Mr. Greatheart if he had not once been Mr. Great Trouble. Valiant for truth would never have put to flight those enemies and would never have been so valiant if the enemy had not first attacked him. So it is with us. We must expect great trouble before we will attain to much faith. Chapter 15 Joy in Life's Hard Times. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 7. Scripture At evening time it shall be light. Zechariah 14 7. I will not discuss the particular occasion upon which these words were uttered, nor will I try to discuss the time to which they more especially refer. Instead, I will take the sentence as a rule of the kingdom, as one of the great laws of God's dispensation of grace, that at evening time it shall be light. Whenever philosophers want to establish a general law, they think it's necessary to collect a considerable number of individual instances. Then they put them together and infer from them a general rule. Happily, this does not need to be done with regard to God. 
When we look abroad in Providence, we have no need to collect a large number of incidents and then infer from them the truth, for since God is immutable, one act of His grace is enough to teach us the rule of His conduct. I find in one place that it is recorded that on a certain occasion, during a certain adverse condition of a nation, God promised that at evening time it should be light. If I found that in any human writing, I would suppose that the thing might have occurred once, that a blessing was conferred in an emergency on a certain occasion, but I could not deduce a rule from it. However, when I find it written in the book of God that on a certain occasion when it was evening time with His people God was pleased to give them light, I feel myself more than justified in deducing from it the rule that there will always be light to His people at evening time. The church at large has had many evening times. If I could come up with a metaphor to describe her history from anything in this lower world, I would describe her as being like the sea. At times the abundance of grace has been gloriously manifest. Wave upon wave has triumphantly rolled in upon the land, covering the mire of sin and claiming the earth for the Lord of hosts. So rapid has been its progress that its course could hardly be obstructed by the rocks of sin and vice. Complete conquest seemed to be foretold by the continual spread of the truth. The happy church thought that the day of her ultimate triumph had certainly arrived. So potent was her word by her ministers, and so glorious was the Lord in the midst of her armies, that nothing could stand against her. She was fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Song of Solomon 6.10. Heresies and schisms were swept away, and false gods and idols lost their thrones. Jehovah Omnipotent was in the midst of His church, and He rode forth upon the white horse, conquering and to conquer. Before long, however, you find that there always came an ebb tide. Again the stream of grace seemed to recede, and the poor church was driven back either by persecution or by internal decay. Instead of gaining upon man's corruption, it seemed as if man's corruption gained on the church. Where there had once been righteousness like the waves of the sea, there was the black mud and mire of the filthiness of mankind. The church had to sing mournful tunes when she sat down and wept by the rivers of Babylon, remembering her former glories and weeping her present desolation. Psalm 137, 1. So it has always been, progressing, reversing, standing still a while, and then progressing once more and falling back again. The whole history of the church has been a history of onward marches and then of quick retreats. It is a history that, I believe, is, on the whole, a history of advance and growth, but which, read chapter by chapter, is a mixture of success and repulse, conquest and discouragement. And so I think it will be, even to the end. We will have our sunrise, our meridian noon, and then the setting in the west. We will have our sweet dawnings of better days, our reformations, our Martin Luther's, and our John Calvin's. We will have our bright full noontide when the gospel is fully preached and the power of God is known, and we will have our sunset of ecclesiastical weakness and decay. But just as sure as the evening tide seems to be drawing over the church, at evening time it shall be light. We can expect to see darker evening times than have ever been seen before. Let us not think that our civilization will be more enduring than any other that has gone before it, unless the Lord will preserve it. It may be that the thought that has often been laughed at as foolishness will be realized, that one day people would sit upon the broken arches of London Bridge and marvel at the civilization that has departed, just as people walk over the mounds of Nimrod and marvel at cities buried there. It is just possible that all the civilization of this country may die out in darkest night. It may be that God will repeat again the great story that has been so often told, I looked, and lo, in the vision I saw a great and terrible beast, and it ruled the nations, but lo, it passed away, and was not. 
Daniel 7, 2-9, Psalm 37, 36. If ever such things should be, if the world would ever have to return to barbarism and darkness, if instead of a constant progress to the brightest day that we sometimes hope for, all our hopes would be dashed, let us rest quite satisfied that at evening time there shall be light, that the end of the world's history will be an end of glory. However red with blood and however dark with sin the world may yet be, it will one day be as pure and perfect as when it was created. The day will come when this poor planet will find itself disrobed of those swaddling bands of darkness that have kept her brightness from breaking forth. God will yet cause His name to be known from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same. Psalm 113, 3. And the shout of jubilee, loud as mighty thunders roar, or the fullness of the sea when it breaks upon the shore, shall yet be heard the wide world o'er. At evening time it shall be light. We know that in nature the very same law that rules the atom also governs the starry celestial bodies. The very law that moulds a tear and bids it trickle from its source, that law preserves the earth a sphere and guides the planets in their course. It is the same way with the laws of grace. At evening time it shall be light to the church. At evening time it shall be light to every individual. Christian, let us descend to lowly things. You have had your bright days in earthly matters. You have sometimes been greatly blessed. You can remember the day when the calf was in the stall, when the olive tree yielded its fruit, and when the fig tree did not deny its harvest. Compare Habakkuk 3.17. You can remember the years when the barn was almost bursting with corn and when the vat overflowed with oil. You remember when the stream of your life was deep, and your ship floated softly on without one disturbing billow of trouble to bother it. You said, In those days I will see no sorrow. God has hedged me all around. He has preserved me. He has kept me. I am the favored of His providence. I know that all things work together for my good, for I can see that it is plainly so. Well, Christian, you have had a sunset after that. The sun that shined so brightly began to cast its rays in a more indirect manner every moment until at last the shadows were long. The sun was setting and the clouds began to gather. Although the light of God's countenance tinged those clouds with glory, yet it was growing dark. Then troubles descended upon you. Your family became sick. Your spouse died. Your crops were poor. Your daily income was diminished. Your cupboard was no longer full. You were wondering when your daily bread would come. You did not know what would become of you. You were brought very low. The bottom of your vessel scraped upon the rocks. There was not enough bounty to float your ship above the rocks of poverty. You used both hard work and thrift, and you added perseverance, but it seemed all in vain. It was in vain that you rose up early and sat up late and ate the bread of carefulness. Psalm 127, 2. You could do nothing to deliver yourself, for all attempts failed. You were ready to die in despair. You thought that the night of your life had gathered with eternal darkness. You did not desire to always live, but would rather have departed from this valley of tears. Psalm 84, 6. Was it not light with you? At evening time? The time of your trouble was just the moment of God's opportunity. When the tide had run out to its very furthest, then it began to turn. Your ebb had its flow, your winter had its summer, your sunset had its sunrise. At evening time it was light. All of a sudden, by some strange work of God, as you thought of it then, you were completely delivered. He brought out your righteousness like the light and your glory as the noonday. Psalm 37, 6. The Lord appeared unto you as in the days of old. Jeremiah 31, 3. He stretched out his hand from above. Psalm 144, 7. 
He drew you out of deep waters. Psalm 18, 16. He set you upon a rock and established your goings. Psalm 40, 2. Chapter 16. Cure for Heartache. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, 27. It is the easiest thing in the world, in times of difficulty, to let the heart be troubled. It is very natural for us to give up and drift with the stream, to feel that it is of no use taking arms against such a sea of trouble, but that it is better to lie passive and to say, If one must be ruined, so let it be. Despairing idleness is easy enough, especially to evil, rebellious spirits who are willing enough to get into further mischief so that they may have means to blame God even more, against whose providence they have quarreled. Our Lord will not have us be so rebellious. He urges us to take heart and be of good courage even in the worst possible condition, and the wisdom of His advice is that a troubled heart will not help us in our difficulties or out of them. It has never been perceived in time of drought that lamenting has brought showers of rain, or that doubtings, fears, and discouragements in seasons of frost have produced a thaw. We have never heard of a man whose business was declining who managed to multiply the number of his customers by unbelief in God. I do not remember reading of a person whose wife or child was sick who discovered any miraculous healing power in rebellion against the Most High. It is a dark night, but the darkness of your heart will not light a candle for you. It is a terrible tempest, but to quench the fires of comfort and open the doors to admit the howling winds into the chambers of your spirit will not calm the storm. No good comes out of fretful, irritable, unbelieving heart trouble. This lion yields no honey. Judges 14, 8. If it would help you, you might reasonably sit down and weep until the tears had washed away your woe. If it would really of some practical benefit to be suspicious of God and distrustful of His providence, you might have a shadow of excuse. However, since this is a mine out of which no one ever dug any silver, as this is a fishery out of which the diver never brought up a pearl, we would say to renounce that which cannot be of service to you, for as it can do no good, it is certain that it does much harm. A doubting, fretful spirit takes from us the joys we have. You do not have all you could wish, but you still have more than you deserve. Your circumstances are not what they might be, but still they are not even as bad now as the circumstances of some others. Your unbelief makes you forget that health still remains to you if poverty oppresses you, or that if both health and abundance have departed, you are a child of God and your name is not blotted out from the roll of the chosen. There are flowers that bloom in winter, if we simply have grace to see them. There was never a night of the soul so dark but what some lone star of hope could be discerned. There was never a spiritual tempest so fierce but what there was a haven into which the soul could rest if it only had enough confidence in God to make a run for it. Rest assured, that although you have fallen very low, you would have fallen lower if it were not that the everlasting arms are underneath you. A doubting, distrustful spirit will wither the few blossoms that remain on your branch, and if half the wells are frozen by affliction, unbelief will freeze the other half by its despondency. You will gain no good, but you may get incalculable harm by a troubled heart. It is a root that bears no fruit except the bitterness of wormwood. A troubled heart makes that which is bad worse. It magnifies, aggravates, exaggerates, and misrepresents. If an ordinary foe is in your way, a troubled heart makes him swell into a giant. We were in their sight but as grasshoppers, said the ten evil spies, 
Yes, and we were but as grasshoppers in our own sight when we saw them. Numbers 13, 33. But it was not so. No doubt the men were very tall, but they were not so big, after all, as to make an ordinary six foot man look like a grasshopper. Their fears made them grasshoppers by first making them fools. If they had possessed only ordinary courage, they would have been men, but being cowardly, they subsided into grasshoppers. After all, what is an extra three, four, or five feet of flesh to a man? Is the bravest soul the tallest? If he is of shorter stature, but is nimble and courageous, he will have the best of it. Little David made quick work of great Goliath. Yet so it is. Unbelief makes out our difficulties to be most gigantic, and then it leads us to suppose that no one ever had such difficulties before. Therefore, we egotistically lament, I am the man that hath seen affliction. Lamentations 3 1. We claim to be peers in the realm of misery, if not the emperors of the kingdom of grief. Yet it is not so. Why? What troubles you? The headache is excruciating. Well, it is bad enough, but what would you say if you had seven such aches at once? And cold and nakedness to back them. The twitches of rheumatism are horrible. I can very well endorse that statement. But what then? There have been people who have lived with such tortures thrice told all their lives. Like Richard Baxter, who could feel all his bones because each one had made itself heard by its own peculiar pain. What is our complaint compared with the diseases of John Calvin? The man who preached at daybreak every day to the students in the cathedral and worked long past midnight and was a mass of disease, a complicated agony the entire time. You are poor? Yes, but you have your own room, as meagre as it is, and there are hundreds in the workhouse who find piteous comfort there. It's true that you have to work hard, but think of the Huguenot galley slave in the old times who for the love of Christ was bound with chains to the oar and hardly knew rest day or night. Think of the sufferings of the martyrs of Smithfield, or of the saints who rotted in their prisons. Above all, let your eye turn to the great apostle and high priest of your profession, and consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. Hebrews 12, 3. His way was much rougher and darker than mine. Did Jesus thus suffer, and shall I repine? It is the habit of unbelief to draw our picture in the darkest possible colors, to tell us that the road is unusually rough and utterly impassable, that the storm is such a hurricane as never blew before, that our name will be written down in the register of those who perished in the shipwreck, and that it is impossible that we would ever reach the haven. Be of good cheer, soldier, for the battle must soon end. That blood stained banner, when it will wave so high, that shout of triumph, when it will be heard from so many thousand lips, that grand assembly of heroes, all of them made more than conquerors, the sight of the king in his beauty, riding in the chariot of his triumph, paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem, the acclamations of spirits glorified, and the shouts and praise from cherubim and seraphim. All these will make up for all the fightings of today. And they who, with their master, have conquered in the fight, forever and forever, are clad in robes of light. Chapter 17 A Word to the Troubled Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. James 1, 3. Of all things in the world to be dreaded, despair is the chief. Let a man be abandoned to despair, and he is ready for all kinds of sins. When fear unnerves him, action is dangerous, but when despair has loosed his joints and paralyzed his conscience, the vultures hover around him and wait for their prey. As long as a person has hope for himself, you can have hope of him, but Satan's object is to drive out the last idea of hope from people 
so that they then may give themselves up to be his slaves forever. Let me just say to those who are in trouble, and I hope every faithful Christian will repeat what I say again and again, there is hope. There is hope about your financial difficulties, about your sickness, and about your present affliction. God can help you through it. Do not sit down with your elbows on your knees and cry all day. That won't get you through it. Call upon God who sent the trouble. He has a great purpose in it. It may be that He has sent it as a shepherd sends his dog to fetch the wandering sheep to him. It may be that He has a purpose in making you lose worldly things so that you can gain eternal things. Many a mother's soul would not have been saved if it had not been for that dear infant who was taken from her arms. Not until the baby was taken to the skies did God give the attractive influence that drew her heart to pursue the path to heaven. Don't say there is no hope. Other people have been as badly off as you are, and even if it should seem as if it had come to lack of bread, there is still hope. Go and try again on Monday morning. God's providence has a thousand ways of helping us if we simply have the heart to pray. Are you in despair about your character? It may be that there is a woman reading this or listening to this who says, I have fallen, my character is gone, there is no hope for me. My sister, there is lifting up. Others who have fallen as terribly as you have done have been restored by sovereign grace. There may be someone listening to this who has been an alcoholic or is about to become a thief. No one knows it, perhaps, but he is conscious of great degradation, and he says, I will never be able to look my fellow men in the face. Ah, my dear friend, you don't know what Christ can do for you if you simply rest and trust in Him. Suppose you would be made into a new creature. Would not that alter the matter? Oh, you say, that can never be. No, I say, but that will be. For Christ says, Behold, I make all things new. Revelation 21, 5. Scripture, If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. There was an old fable about a spring at which old men washed their faces and then grew young. Now there is a spring that welled up from the heart of the Lord Jesus, and if an old sinner washes in it, not only his face, but his whole spirit will become like unto a little child and will be clean even in the sight of God. There is hope still. Ah, someone says, but you don't know my situation. No, my dear friend, and I don't particularly desire to know it, because this sweeping truth can meet it no matter what it is. Scripture all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Matthew 12, 31. Scripture, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. Noah's ark was not made to hold only a few mites, but the elephant, the lion, and the largest beasts of prey went in, and room was found for each of them. So my master, who is the great ark of salvation, did not come into this world to save a few who are little sinners, but he is able to save unto the uttermost all who come unto God by him. Hebrews 7, 25. See him over there on the cross, in extreme agony, bearing numberless griefs and torments, and sweating in agony, all for love of you who were his enemies. Trust him. Trust him, for there is hope. There is lifting up. No matter how bowed down you may be, there is hope in the gospel even for you. I seem as if I were walking along a corridor, and I see a number of condemned cells. As I listen at the keyhole, I can hear those inside weeping in dejected, sorrowful laments. There is no hope, no hope, no hope. I can see the jailer at the other end smiling calmly to himself as he knows that none of the prisoners can come out as long as they say there is no hope. It's a sign that their chains are not broken, and that the bolts of their cells are not removed. But if I could look in, I think I can, 
I think I can open the little wicket gate and cry, There is hope. He who said there is no hope is a liar and a murderer from the beginning and is the father of lies. John 8 44. There is hope since Jesus died. There is hope anywhere except in the infernal lake of fire. There is hope in the hospital where someone has become sick and is within the last hour of his departure. There is hope even though people have sinned themselves outside the bounds of society. There is hope for the convict, even though he has had to face punishment. There is hope for the man who has cast himself away. Jesus is still able to save. No hope is not to be said by any member of the sailor's life brigade while he sees the crew of the sinking vessel. No hope is not to be said by any member of the fire department while he knows there are living people in the burning building. No hope is not to be said by any member of the valiant brigade of the Christian church while the soul is still within reach of the sound of mercy. No hope is a cry that no human tongue should utter, and that no human heart should heed. Oh, may God grant us grace whenever we get an opportunity to go and tell all we meet with who are bowed down that there is hope, and when we tell them where this hope can be found. Tell them it's only found at the cross. Tell them it's through the precious blood. Tell them it's to be obtained for nothing but through simply trusting Christ. Tell them it is of free grace, that no merits of theirs are needed, that no good things are they to bring, but that they may come freely and find hope and strength in Christ. However, nothing will avail unless there is much prayer. We need to pray that God may give efficacy to the counsels He has given us, and that He will reward our obedience to them with abundant fruit. O brethren, prayer is the principal thing for us who have no might of ourselves. It is wonderful what prayer can do for any of us. A dear friend said to me the other day, Look at Jacob. In the early part of his life there was much that was unseemly in his character, and very much that was unhappy in his circumstances. Deceitful himself, he was often the victim of deceit, reaping the fruit of his own ways. But one night, in prayer, what a change it made in him! It raised him from the deep poverty of a cunning supplanter to the noble greatness of a prince in Israel. Bethel itself is hardly more memorable in Jacob's history than Peniel. What might one night spent in prayer do for some of us? Suppose we were to try it instead of the soft bed. We don't need to go to the brook, but it is enough that, like Jacob, we would be left alone in some place where sighs and cries would be heard by none but God. One night spent in this way, in solitary prayer, might put the spurs on some of you and make you spiritual knights in God's army, able to do great exploits. Daniel 11:32. Oh yes, may all other gracious exercises be started in prayer, crowned with prayer, and perfected by much prayer. Chapter 18. Things Working Together for Good. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Romans 8.28. Scripture. We know that all things work. Romans 8.28. Look around, above, and beneath, and all things work. They work even in opposition to idleness. The idle man who folds his arms or lies upon the bed of sloth is an exception to God's rule, for except himself all things work. There is not a star, even though it seems to sleep in the deep blue firmament, that does not travel its myriads of miles and work. There is not an ocean or a river that is not always working, either clapping its thousand hands with storms or bearing in its arms the freight of nations. There is not a silent nook within the deepest forest glade where work is not going on. Nothing is idle. The world is a great machine, but it's never standing still. Silently through all the watches of the night and through all the hours of the day, the earth revolves on its axis 
and works out its predestined course. Silently the forest grows, and before long it is felled, but all the while between its growing and felling it is at work. Everywhere the earth works. Mountains work. Nature in its inmost bowels is at work. And even the center of the great heart of the world is always beating. Sometimes we discover its working in the volcano and the earthquake, but even when most still, all things are always working. They are always working, too, in opposition to the word play. Not only are they ceaselessly active, but they are active for a purpose. We are apt to think that the motion of the world and the different changes of the stars are simply like the turning around of a child's windmill, that they produce nothing. That old preacher Solomon once said as much as that. He said, The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Ecclesiastes 1, 5-6. However, Solomon did not add that things are not always what they seem. The world is not at play. It has a purpose in its wildest movement. Avalanche, hurricane, and earthquake are simply order in an unusual form. Destruction and death are simply progress in veiled attire. Everything that is and is done works out some great end and purpose. The great machine of this world is not only in motion, but there is something weaving in it that as yet mortal eye has not fully seen, which our text hints at when it says that it is working out for God's people. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28. Once again, all things work in opposition to the Lord's day, the Sabbath. We morally speak of work, especially on this day, as being the opposite of sacred rest and worship. Now, at the present moment, all things work. Since the day Adam fell, all things have had to toil and labor. Before Adam's fall, the world kept a continuous holiday, but now the world has come to its work days, and now it has to toil. When Adam was in the garden, the world had its Sabbath, and it will not have another Sabbath until the millennium will dawn. Then, when all things have ceased to work, and the kingdoms will be given up to God the Father, the world will have its Sabbath and will rest. At present, though, all things do work. Let us not wonder if we also have to work. If we have to toil, let us remember that this is the world's week of toil. The six thousand years of continual labor, toil, and travail have not just happened to us alone, but to the whole of God's great universe. The whole world is groaning and travailing. Romans 8.22. Let us not be neglectful in doing our work. If all things are working, let us work too. Work while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. John 9.4. Let the idle and slothful remember that they are a great anomaly. They are blots in the great writing of God. They mean nothing. In all the book of letters with which God has written out the great word, Work, they are nothing at all. But let the one who works, though it be with the sweat of his brow and with aching hands, remember that if he is seeking to bless the Lord's people, God is in sympathy with all things, not only in sympathy with their work, but in sympathy with their aim. All things work together that is in opposition to their apparent confliction. Looking upon the world with a mere eye of sense and reason, we say, yes, all things work, but they work contrary to one another. There are opposite currents. The wind blows to the north and to the south. The world's boat, it is true, is always tossed with waves, but these waves toss her first to the right and then to the left. They don't steadily bear her onward to her desired haven. It is true that the world is always active, but it is with the activity of the battlefield, wherein army encounters army, and the weaker are overcome. 
Be not deceived. It is not so. Things are not what they seem. All things work together. There is no opposition in God's providence. The raven wing of war is co worker with the dove of peace. The tempest does not strive with the peaceful calm. Although they seem to be in opposition, they are linked together and work together. Look at our history. How many events have seemed to be conflicting in their day that have worked out good for us? The strifes of barons and kings for mastery might have been thought to be likely to tread out the last spark of liberty, but instead they kindled the fire. The various rebellions of nations, the upheavals of society, the strife of anarchy, the tumults of war, all, all these things, overruled by God, have only made the chariot of the church progress more mightily. They have not failed of their predestinated purpose. They resulted in good for the people of God. I know it's very hard to believe this. What? you say? I have been sick for many days, and my wife and children are dependent on my daily labor and are crying for food. Will this work together for my good? So says the word, and before long you will see that it will be proven true. I have been in business, says another, and this commercial pressure has brought me very low and has distressed me. Is this for my good? You are a Christian. I know you don't seriously ask the question, for you know the answer. He who said, All things work together, will soon prove to you that there is a harmony in the most discordant parts of your life. When your biography is written, you will find that the dark page harmonized with the bright one, that the dark and cloudy day was but a glorious background to set forth the brighter noontide of your joy. All things work together. There is never a clash in the world. People think so. But it never is so. The charioteers of the Roman circus could, with much cleverness and art, and with glowing wheels, avoid each other. But God, with skill infinitely masterly, guides the fiery warhorses of man's passion, yokes the storm, bits the tempest, and, keeping each clear of the other, still brings forth good from seeming evil, and brings it out better still, and better still, in infinite progression. We must also understand the word together in another sense. All things work together for good. That is to say, none of them work separately. I remember an old minister using a very succinct and simple metaphor. All things work together for good. However, any one of those all things might destroy us if taken alone. The physician prescribes medicine. You go to the pharmacist, and he puts it together. There is something taken from this drawer, something from that file, something from that shelf. It's very possible that any one of those ingredients might be a deadly poison that could kill you outright if you would take it separately. But he puts one into the mortar, and then another, and then another. And when he has worked them all up with his pestle, and has made a compound, he gives them all to you as a whole. Together, They work for your good. But any one of the ingredients might have operated fatally or in a manner detrimental to your health if taken separately. Learn then that it is wrong to ask about any particular act of providence if it is for your good. Remember that it is not the one thing alone that is for your good, but it is the one thing put with another thing, and that with a third, and that with a fourth, and all these mixed together that works for your good. Your being sick very probably might not be for your good, if worked alone. But God has something to follow your sickness, some blessed deliverance to follow your poverty, and He knows that when He has mixed the different experiences of your life together, they will produce good for your soul and eternal good for your spirit. We know very well that there are many things that happen to us in our lives that would be the ruin of us if we were always to continue in the same condition. Too much joy would overwhelm us, and too much misery would drive us to despair. But the joy and the misery, the battle and the victory, the storm and the calm, all compounded, 
make that sacred remedy whereby God makes all His people perfect through suffering. Hebrews 2.10 And leads them to ultimate happiness. All things work together for good. There are different senses to the word good. There is the sense of the person of the world, who will show us any good? By this he means short-term good, the good of the moment. Who will put honey into my mouth? Who will feed my belly with hidden treasures? Who will garnish my back with purple and fill my table with plenty? That is what they see as good, the vat bursting with wine and the barn full of corn. God has never promised His people that all things will work together for such good as that. Very likely, all things will work together in a way quite contrary to that. Christian, don't expect that all things will work together to make you rich. It is just possible that they may all work to make you poor. It may be that all the different providences that will happen to you will come wave upon wave, washing your fortune upon the rocks until it is wrecked. And then waves will break over you until, in that poor boat, the humble remnant of your fortune, you will be out on the wide sea with no one to help you except the omnipotent God. Don't expect then that all these things will work together as for your worldly good. The Christian understands the word good in another sense. By good, he understands it to refer to spiritual good. Ah, he says, I don't call gold good, but I call faith good. I don't think it is always for my good to increase in treasure, but I know it's good to grow in grace. I don't know that it is for my good that I should be respectable and walk in good society, but I know that it is for my good that I should walk humbly with my God. I don't know that it is for my good that my children should always be around me like olive branches around my table. But I know that it is for my good that I should flourish in the courts of my God, and that I should be the means of winning souls from going down into the pit. I am not certain that it is altogether for my good to have kind and generous friends with whom I can hold fellowship. But I know that it is for my good that I should hold fellowship with Christ and have communion with Him, even though it would be in His sufferings. I know it is good for me that my faith, my love, and my every grace should grow and increase, and that I should be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, my blessed Lord and Master. To the Christian, however, the highest good he can receive on earth is to grow in grace. There, he says, I would rather be bankrupt in business than to be bankrupt in grace. It is better to have my fortune decrease than that I should backslide. Let your waves and your billows roll over me. It is better for me to have an ocean of trouble than a drop of sin. I would rather have your rod a thousand times upon my shoulders, O my God, than I would once put out my hand to touch that which is forbidden, or allow my foot to run in the way of those who oppose you. The highest good a Christian has here is spiritual good. All things work together for a Christian's lasting good. They all work to bring him to the Saviour's feet. Scripture, So he bringeth them to their desired haven, said the psalmist, Psalm 107, 30, by storm and tempest, flood and hurricane. All the troubles of a Christian only wash him nearer heaven. The rough winds simply hurry his passage across the straits of this life to the port of eternal peace. All things work together for the Christian's eternal and spiritual good. Yet, sometimes, all things also work together for the Christian's earthly good. You know the story of old Jacob. Scripture, Joseph is not, Simeon is not, and now ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me, said the old patriarch. Genesis 42, 36. However, if he could have read God's secrets, he might have found that Simeon was not lost, for he was retained as a hostage. He would have found that Joseph was not lost, but had only gone before to smooth the passage of his gray hairs into the grave. He would have learned that even Benjamin was to be taken away by Joseph in love to his brother. What seemed to be against Jacob, even in earthly matters, 
was for him. You may have heard also the story of that eminent martyr who was known to often say, All things work together for good. When he was seized by the officers of Queen Mary to be taken to the stake to be burned, he was treated so roughly on the road that he broke his leg. His oppressors mockingly said, All things work together for good, do they? How will your broken leg work for your good? I don't know how it will, he said, but I know it will work for my good, and you will see it so. Strange to say, it proved true that it was for his good, for, being delayed a day or so on the road through his lameness, he arrived in London just in time to hear that Elizabeth was proclaimed queen, and so he escaped the stake by his broken leg. He turned around to the men who thought that they were carrying him to his death, and he said to them, Now will you believe that all things work together for good? Although the general message of the text was about spiritual good, indeed, sometimes in the main current there may be carried some rich and rare earthly benefits for God's children in addition to the richer spiritual blessings. Chapter 19 Consolation Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, 10. We sometimes speak and think very lightly of doubts and fears, but that's not God's estimation of them. Our Heavenly Father considers them to be great evils, extremely harmful to us, and exceedingly dishonorable to Himself, for He very frequently forbids our fears and just as often offers us the most powerful remedies for them. Fear not is a frequent utterance of the divine mouth. I am with you is the fervent, soul-cheering argument to support it. Unless the Lord had judged our fears to be a great evil, He would not have so often forbidden them or provided such a heavenly release from them. Martin Luther used to say that to comfort a desponding spirit is as difficult as to raise the dead. However, we have a God who both raises the dead from their graves and raises His people from their despair. Scripture Though ye have lean among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. Psalm 68, 13 Scripture Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Psalm 30, 5. Saul was subject to fits of deep despondency. But when David, the skillful harpist, laid his hand among the obedient strings, the evil spirit departed, overcome by the subduing power of melody. Our text is such a harp and if the Holy Spirit will only touch its strings, its sweet discourse will charm away the demon of despair. I am with thee. It is a harp of ten strings that contains the full chords of consolation. Its notes quiver to the height of elation, or descend to the hollow base of the deepest grief. More or less, all believers need consolation at all times, because their lives are very peculiar ones. The walk of faith is one protracted miracle. The life, the conflict, the support, and the triumph of faith are all far above the vision of the eye of sense. The inner life is a world of mysteries. We see nothing beneath or before us, yet we stand upon a rock and go from strength to strength. We march onward unto what seems to be destruction, and we find safety blooming beneath our feet. During our whole Christian career, the promises of God must be applied to the heart, or else such is the weakness of flesh and blood that we are ready to go back to the food of the Egypt of a carnal sense. Exodus 16, 3, and leave the delights that faith alone can provide us. There are certain special occasions when the Comforter's work is needed, and certainly one of these is when we are afflicted with much physical pain. Many bodily pains can be endured without affecting the mind, but there are certain others whose sharp fangs work themselves into the marrow of our nature, 
boring their way most horribly through the brain and the spirit. For these, much grace is needed. When the head is throbbing, the heart is palpitating, and the whole system is in disorder, it is so natural to say with Jacob, All these things are against me. Genesis 42 36. It is easy then to complain of providence and to think that we are the ones above all others who have seen affliction. This is the time for the promise to be applied with power. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Isaiah 41 10. God will make all your bed in your sickness. Psalm 41 3. When bodily pain gives every sign of increasing, or when we expect the surgeon with his dreaded knife, then we want and need the upholding gentleness of God in order to be sustained under sufferings at the thought of which the flesh shudders. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Like the song of the nightingale, those words are most sweet when heard in the night season. When the trouble comes in our relative sorrows, borne personally by those dear to us, when we see them fading gradually by illness and disease, like lilies snapped at the stalk, when they are suddenly swept away as the grass falls beneath the mower's blade, when we have to visit the grave again and again and each time leave a part of ourselves behind us, when our clothing of mourning reveals our woe, and we would readily sit down in the dust and sprinkle ashes upon our heads because the desire of our eyes is taken from us, Ezekiel 24, 16. Then we require the heavenly comforter. Then indeed the skillful harpist is in great request, and sweet to the heart are notes like these, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. When all the currents of providence run counter to us, and when, after taking arms against a sea of trouble, we find ourselves unable to stem the boisterous torrent, and are being swept down the stream, loss after loss, riches taking to themselves wings and flying away until we see nothing before us except absolute need, and when we are actually brought to know what real need is, then we require abundant grace to sustain our spirits. It's not very easy to come down from wealth to poverty, from abundance to emptiness, with perfect submission. That is a philosophy to be learned only where Paul was taught it when he said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Philippians 4 11. Some people would find it hard to be content in that widow's position who has seven children and nothing to maintain them but the small amount that is wrung out to her for her labours with her needle, at which she sits, stitch, 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 far into the dead of the night, stitching her very soul away. You might not find it quite as easy to bear poverty if you were shunned by men who courted you in prosperity, and who now do not know you if they meet you in the street. There are bitter things about the poor man's circumstances that are not easily rinsed from his cup. And then it is that the gracious soul needs the promise, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Isaiah 41 10. Scripture A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. Psalm 68 5. Scripture Thy Maker is thine husband. Isaiah 54, 5. If you are brought into this condition, may my Lord and Master say to you, It is I, be not afraid. Matthew 14, 27. Dear listener, did you ever stand as a servant of God alone in the midst of opposition? Were you ever called to attack some deadly popular error? and, with a rough, bold hand, like one who opposes the veneration of images, to dash down the graven images of the age? Have you heard the clamour of many, some saying this thing and some the other, some saying, He is a good man, but others saying, Nay, but he deceiveth the people? John 7, 12. Did you ever see the animosity of the priests of Baal flashing from their faces and foaming from their mouths? Did you ever read their hard expressions and see their misrepresentations of your speech 
and of your motives? Did you ever feel the delight of saying, The best of all is that God is with us, and in the name of God, instead of folding up the standard, we will set up our banners? If this is offensive, we intend to be more offensive still, and will throw down the gauntlet once more in the name of the God of truth and against the error of the times. If you have ever passed through the ordeal, then you have needed the words, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Isaiah 41.10. Scripture Who art thou, that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the Son of Man which shall be made as grass? Isaiah 51.12. Scripture I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. Jeremiah 15.20. Scripture Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Isaiah 54, 4. My dear listener, we will need this word of comfort most of all when we go down the sloping banks of a dark river, when we hear the noise of its waves and feel the dreary influence of its dark flood, but cannot see the other side, when the mists of depression of spirit hide from us Jerusalem the golden, and our eye catches no glimpse of the land that floweth with milk and honey. Deuteronomy 26, 9, because the soul is occupied with present pain and is wrapped in darkness that can be felt. In such a condition, we linger shivering on the brink and fear to launch away. We talk of death too lightly. It is solemn work to the best of men. It would be no child's play to an apostle to die. Yet if we can hear the whisper, Fear thou not, for I am with thee, then the mists will sweep away from the river, and that stream that was previously muddy will become as clear as crystal, and we will see the rock of ages at the bottom of the flood. Then we will descend with confidence, we will hear the rippling of the death stream, and we will think it is music. Yes, and it will be music, as it melts into the songs of the angels, who will accompany us through its depths. When those mists have rolled away, it will be delightful to see the shining ones coming to meet us, who will go with us up the celestial hills to the pearly gate and accompany us to the throne of God, where we will rest forever. Happy are they who will hear their Lord say to them, I am with you, do not be afraid. We read in this word of great events that will happen to us after death, but we do not well understand the revelation. After death, serious events will follow that may well strike a person with awe as he thinks about them. There is a judgment and a resurrection. There is a trumpet call that will summon the children of men to hear their future destiny from heaven's doomsday book. The world will be on fire, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 2 Peter 3.10 there will be a mighty appearing of the great judge at the dread judgment. There will be the winding up of this age and the gathering together of all things in one that are in Christ. There will be a casting down into hell of the tares bound up in bundles to burn, Matthew thirteen thirty, and the fire that never shall be quenched, Mark nine forty four, will send up its smoke for ever and ever, Revelation fourteen eleven. What about that future? Well, faith can look forward to it without any quivering. Faith does not fear, for it hears the voice of the everlasting God saying, I am with you, I will be with you when your dust will rise. Your gratifying first view will be the King in His beauty. You will be satisfied when you will wake up in His likeness. Psalm 17, 15. I will be with you when the heavens are on fire. I will be your preserver your comforter, your heaven, your all in all. Therefore, do not fear, but look forward with unmoved delight to all the mystery and the glory of the age to come. Chapter 20 Difficulties in Front, Enemies Behind Let us therefore fear, lest 
a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Hebrews 4, 1. No doubt the children of Israel supposed that all of their big troubles were over. The Egyptians had sent them away, pleading with them to depart and loading them with riches. Terror had smitten the heart of Egypt, for from the king on the throne to the prisoner in the dungeon all was dismay and fear on account of Israel. Egypt was glad for them when they departed. Therefore the children of Israel said among themselves, We will now march to Canaan at once. There will be no more dangers, no more troubles, and no more trials. The Egyptians themselves have sent us away, and they are too much afraid of us ever to trouble us again. Now we will walk through the desert with hurried footsteps, and when a few more days have passed, we will enter into the land of our possession, the land that flows with milk and honey. Not quite so speedily, said God. The time has not yet arrived for you to rest. It is true that I have delivered you from Egypt, but there is much you have to learn before you will be prepared to dwell in Canaan. Therefore, I will lead you around and will instruct and teach you. The Lord led the children of Israel around, through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, until they arrived at Baal Zephon, where the craggy mountains shut them in on both sides. Pharaoh heard of it, and he came upon them to overcome them. The Israelites stood in terrible fright and jeopardy of their lives. This is how it usually is with the believer. He marches out of Egypt spiritually at the time of his conversion, and he says to himself, Now I will always be happy. He has a bright eye and a light heart, for his chains have been dashed to the ground, and he no longer feels the lash of conscience upon his shoulder. Now, he says, I may have a short life, but it will be a happy one. A few more rolling years at most will land me on fair Canaan's coast. The Israelites had a great trial sent by God Himself. The Red Sea was there in front of them. It was not an enemy that put the sea there, but it was God Himself. We may therefore think that the Red Sea represents some great and trying providence that the Lord will be sure to place in the path of every newborn child of God in order to test His faith and to test the sincerity of His trust in God. I don't know whether your experience will back up mine, but I can say that the worst difficulty I ever met with, or think I can ever meet with, happened a little time after my conversion to God. You must generally expect, very soon after you have been brought to know and love Him, that you will have some great, broad, deep Red Sea right before your path, which you will hardly know how to pass. Sometimes it will occur in the family. The husband says, for example, if he is an ungodly man, You will not attend such and such a place of worship. I absolutely forbid you to be baptized or join that church. There is a Red Sea before you. You have done nothing wrong. It is God Himself who places that Red Sea before your path. Maybe before you were converted, you were carrying on a business that you cannot now conscientiously continue, and there is a Red Sea that you have to cross in renouncing your means of livelihood. You don't see how it is to be done. You don't know how you are to provide for yourself and to provide things honest in the sight of all men. Romans 12 17. Maybe your employment caused you to be among people with whom you lived before on friendly terms, and now they suddenly say, Come on, won't you do as you used to do? There again is a Red Sea before you. It is a hard struggle. You don't want to come out and say, I cannot and I will not, for I am a Christian. You stand still, half afraid to go forward. Maybe it's something that comes more directly from God. You find that just when He plants a vine in your heart, He causes all the vines in your vineyard to wilt. When He plants you in His own garden, it is then that He uproots all your comforts and your joys. Just when the sun of righteousness is rising upon you, your own little candle is blown out. Just when you seem to need it most, your gourd is withered, your prosperity departs, and your abundance begins to decline. It may not be so with all of you, 
but I think that most of God's people have not long escaped the bondage of Egypt before they find some terrible rolling sea battered about by tempestuous winds directly in their path. They stand in dread and say, O God, how can I bear this? I thought I could give up all for you, but now I feel as if I could do nothing. I thought I would be in heaven and everything would be easy, but here is a sea I cannot cross. There are no ships to carry me across. It's not bridged even by your mercy. I must swim it, or else I am afraid that I will perish. The children of Israel would not have cared about the Red Sea a single bit if they had not been terrified by the Egyptians who were behind them. These Egyptians, I think, may be interpreted by way of parable as the representatives of those sins that we thought were completely dead and gone. For a little while after conversion, sin does not trouble a Christian. He is very happy and cheerful in knowing he is forgiven. However, before many days are past, he will understand what Paul said, I find then a law that, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Romans 7.21. The first moment after he obtains his liberty, he laughs and leaps in an ecstasy of joy. He thinks, Oh, I will soon be in heaven. As for sin, I can trample that beneath my feet. But nearly before another Lord's day has gladdened his spirit, he finds that sin is too much for him. The old corruptions that he thought were laid in their graves rise up and begin again, and he begins to cry, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7.24. He sees all his old sins pursuing him like Pharaoh and his host pursued the Israelites to the borders of the Red Sea. There is a great trial before him. He thinks that he could bear that. He thinks that he could walk through the Red Sea. But those Egyptians are behind him. He thought he would have never seen them again. They were the plague and torment of his life when they made him work in the brick kiln. He sees his old master, the very man who used to lay the lash on his shoulders, riding quickly after him. There are the eyes of that dark Pharaoh flashing like fire in the distance. He sees the horrid, scowling face of the tyrant, and he trembles. Satan is after him, and all the legions of hell seem to be let loose, if possible, to utterly destroy his soul. Moreover, at such a time, our sins are more disturbing to us than they were before they were forgiven. Because when we were in Egypt, we never saw the Egyptians mounted on horses or in chariots. They only appeared as our taskmasters with their whips. Now, though, these people see the Egyptians on horseback, clad in armor. They behold all the mighty men of valor coming out with their warlike instruments to slay them. These poor children of Israel had such faint hearts. They no sooner saw the Egyptians than they began to cry out. When they saw the Red Sea before them, they murmured against their deliverer. A faint heart is the worst enemy a Christian can have. While he keeps his faith firm, while the anchor is secured deep in the rock, he never needs to fear the storm. But when the hand of faith has no strength, or when the eye of faith is dim, things will be difficult with us. As for the Egyptian, he may throw his spear. As long as we can catch it in our shield of faith, we are not terrified by the weapon. But if we lose our faith, the spear becomes a deadly dart. While we have faith, the Red Sea may flow before us as deep and as dark as it pleases. For like Leviathan, we trust we can empty the Jordan River in one drink. However, if we have no faith, then at the most insignificant trickling stream, which faith could take up in her hands in a single moment and drink like Gideon's men, poor unbelief stands quivering and crying, Ah, I will be drowned in the floods! or I will be slain by the foe. There is no hope for me. I am driven to despair. It would have been better for me that I had died in Egypt than that I would come here to be slain by the hand of the enemy. When the child of God is firstborn, he has very little faith because he has had very little experience. He has not tested the promise, and therefore he doesn't know its faithfulness. He has not used the arm of faith and therefore the muscles of it have not become strong. 
Let him live a little longer and become strengthened in the faith, and he will not care about Red Seas, nor even about the Egyptians. Now, though, his little heart beats against the walls of his body, and he laments, Ah, me! Ah, me! O wretched man that I am! How will I ever find deliverance? Cheer up, then, heir of grace! What is your trial? Has providence brought it upon you? If so, unerring wisdom will deliver you from it. What is it you are now dismayed by? As truly as you are alive, God will remove it. Do you think God's cloudy pillar would ever lead you to a place where God's right arm would fail you? Do you imagine that He would ever guide you into such a canyon that He couldn't lead you out again? The providence that apparently misleads will in actuality support you. That which leads you into difficulties guards you against your foes. It casts darkness on your sins while it gives light to you. How sweet providence is to a child of God when he can reflect upon it. He can look out into this world and say, No matter how great my troubles are, they are not as great as my Father's power. No matter how difficult my circumstances may be, yet all things around me are working together for good. He who holds up the unpillared arch of the starry heavens can also support my soul without a single apparent support. He who guides the stars in their well ordered courses, even when they seem to dance around the sky, can certainly overrule my trials in such a way that he will bring order out of confusion, and will produce lasting good from seeming evil. He who bridles the storm and puts the bit in the mouth of a tempest can certainly restrain my trial and keep my sorrows in subjection. I do not need to fear while the lightnings are in his hands, the thunders sleep within his lips, the oceans gurgle from his fist, the clouds are in the hollow of his hands, the rivers are turned by his foot, and he digs the channels of the sea. Surely he who gives angels their wings can furnish a worm with strength. He who guides a cherub will not be overcome by the trials of an ant like myself. He who makes the largest planet glide in dignity and keep its predestined orbit can make a little atom like myself move in my proper course and direct me as he pleases. Christian, there is no sweeter pillow than providence, and when providence seems unfavorable, believe it still. Place it under your head, for you can depend upon it that there is comfort in its arms. There is hope for you, child of God. That great trouble that is to come your way in the early part of your pilgrimage is planned by love, the same love that will intervene as your protector. The children of Israel had another refuge. They knew that they were the covenant people of God, and that even though they were in difficulties, God had brought them there, and therefore God, let me say it with reverence, was bound in honor to bring them out of that trouble into which He had brought them. Well, says the child of God, I know I am in a difficulty, but I also know that I did not come out of Egypt by myself. I know that He brought me out. I know that I did not escape by my own power or slay my firstborn sins myself. I know that He did it. Even though I fled from a tyrant, I know that God made my feet mighty for travel, for there was not one feeble person in all our tribes. I know that even though I am at the Red Sea, I did not run there uncalled, but He directed me to go there. Therefore, I give my fears to the winds. If He has led me here into this difficulty, He will lead me out, and He will lead me through. The third refuge that the children of Israel had was in a man, and without him neither of the two others would have been of any avail. It was the man Moses. He did everything for them. Your greatest refuge, O child of God, in all your trials is in a man, not in Moses, but in Jesus, not in the servant, but in the master. He is interceding for you, unseen and unheard by you, even as Moses did for the children of Israel. If in the dim distance you could catch the sweet syllables of his voice as they distill from his lips and see his heart as it speaks for you, you would take comfort. 
for God hears that man when he pleads. He can overcome every difficulty. He doesn't have a rod but a cross that can divide the Red Sea. Not only does he have a cloudy pillar of forgiving grace that can dim the eyes of your enemies and keep them at a distance, but he also has a cross that can open the Red Sea and drown your sins in the very midst. He will not leave you. Look, he stands over there on that rock of heaven with his cross in hand, even as Moses stood with his rod. Cry to Jesus, for with that uplifted cross he will open a path for you and will guide you through the sea. He will make those foamy floods, which had been friends forever, stand asunder like enemies. Call to him, and he will make you a way in the midst of the ocean and a path through the pathless sea. Cry to him, and there will not be a sin of yours left alive. He will sweep them all away, and the king of sin, the devil, will also be overwhelmed beneath the Saviour's blood, while you sing, Hell and my sins obstruct my path, but hell and sin are conquered foes. My Jesus nailed them to his cross and sang the triumph as he rose. Chapter 21 a harp's sweet notes. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, and with the harp and the voice of a psalm. Psalm 98, 5. This harp sounds most sweetly. All through life I may picture the saints as marching to its music, even as the children of Israel set forward to the notes of the silver trumpets. Israel came to the Red Sea. They might well be afraid, for the Egyptians were behind them. The crack of their whips could be heard, and the rolling sea was before them. But Israel marched confidently through its depths because the word was given, Fear not, Jehovah is with his people. Exodus 14, 13 to 14. See the pillar of cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night. How safely they follow its direction, even through the heart of the sea. They tread the sand on the other side. It is an arid waste. How will they support themselves or their flocks? Scripture, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Isaiah 41, 10. The manna drops from heaven, and the waters ripple from the rock. But look, they come to Jordan. It is their last difficulty, and then they will reach the land of their inheritance. Jordan divides. What ails you, O Jordan, that you were driven back? Psalm 114, 5. God was with his people. They did not fear, but entered into their rest. This is the heritage of all the saints. As I thought of the life of faith, I saw before my eyes, as in a vision, a lofty staircase of light. Led by an invisible hand, I mounted step by step. When I had ascended long and far, the staircase turned and turned again and again. I could see no supports to this elevated staircase no pillars of iron, no props of stone. It seemed to hang in the air. As I climbed, I looked up to see where the staircase went, but I saw no farther than the step on which I stood, except that every once in a while the clouds of light above me parted, and I thought I saw the throne of the Eternal and the heaven of His glory. My next step seemed to be upon the air, yet when I boldly put down my foot I found it as firm as stone beneath me. I looked back at the steps I had already taken, and was amazed, but I dared not tarry, for forward was the voice that urged me on. I knew, for faith had told me, that the winding stairs would end at last, beyond the sun and moon and stars, in the excellent glory. As I occasionally gazed down into the depths out of which the stairs had lifted me, I shuddered at what my fate would be if I would slip from my standing or if the next step would plunge me into the abyss. Over the edge of that step upon which I stood, I gazed with awe, for I saw nothing but a gaping void of black darkness, and into this I must plunge my foot in the faith of finding another step beneath it. I would have been unable to advance, and would have sat down in utter despair if I had not heard the word from above of one in whom I trusted, saying, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I knew that my mysterious guide could not err. I felt that infinite faithfulness would not tell me to take a step if it were not safe, and therefore, climbing still, 
I stand at this hour happy and rejoicing, even though my faith is all above my own comprehension and my work is above my own ability. We believe in the providence of God, but we do not believe half enough in it. Remember that omnipotence has servants everywhere, set in their places at every point of the road. In the old days of the post horses, there were always relays of swift horses ready to carry onward the king's mail. It is wonderful how God has his relays of providential agents. When he is done with one, there's always another ready to take his place. Sometimes you have found one friend fail you. Maybe another is recently dead and buried. Ah, you say, what will I do? Well, God knows how to carry on the purposes of his providence. He will raise up someone else. How remarkably punctual providence is. You and I make appointments and sometimes miss them by half an hour, but God never missed an appointment yet. God is never before his time, though we often wish he were, but he is never behind, not by one tick of the clock. When the children of Israel were to go down out of Egypt, all the pharaohs in the pyramids, if they had risen to life again, could not have kept them in bondage another minute. Scripture Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go. Exodus 8 1. It was time, and they must go. All the kings of the earth, and all the princes thereof, are in subjection to the kingdom of God's providence, and he can move them just as he pleases. Just as the showman pulls his strings and moves his puppets, so can God move all who are on earth and the angels in heaven according to his will and pleasure. And now, trembler, why are you afraid? Fear thou not, for I am with thee. All the mysterious arrangements of providence work for our good. Touch that string again, you who are in trouble, and see if that harp is not a rare instrument. God well knows how, if he does not intervene openly to deliver us in trouble, to infuse strength into our sinking hearts. Scripture There appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. It is said of our Lord, Luke 22, 43, And I do not doubt that invisible spirits are often sent by God from heaven to invigorate our spirits when they are ready to sink. Have you never felt it? You sat down an hour ago and wept as if your heart would break, and then you bowed your knee in solemn prayer and spread the case before the Lord. Afterward, when you came down from the prayer room, you felt as if you could joyfully encounter the trouble. You were humbled and bowed down under it, as a child under a chastening rod, but you gave yourself up to it. You knew that it was your father who smote you, and so you did not rebel any longer. You went into the world determined to meet the difficulty that you thought would crush you, feeling that you were quite able to bear it. I have read of those who bathe in those baths of Germany that are saturated with iron. After bathing, they have felt as if they were made of iron, and were able in the heat of the sun to cast off the heat as though they were dressed in steel. Happy indeed are they who bathe in the bath of such a promise as this, I am with thee. Put your whole soul into that consoling element. Plunge into it, and you will feel your strength suddenly renewed so that you can bear troubles that before would have overwhelmed you. There is a way by which the Lord can be with His people that is best of all. That way is by noticeable manifestations of His presence, imparting joy and peace that surpass all understanding. I will not try to explain the exhilaration and delight that is caused in a child of God by the consciousness that God is near him. In one sense, He is always near us, but there is an opening of our eye and an unsealing of our ear a putting away of the external senses, and an opening of the inner spiritual sense by which the inner life of the Christian becomes wondrously conscious of the pervading presence of the Most High. I cannot describe it, for it's not a thing for words. It's like what heaven must be. It is a stray gleam of the sunlight of paradise that has fallen upon this sinful world. 
You are as sure that God is with you as you are sure that you are in the body. Although the walls do not glow, and the humble floor does not blaze with light, and although no rustle of angels' wings is heard, yet you are like Moses when he put off his shoes from his feet, for the place whereon you stand has become holy ground to you. Exodus 3, 5. Bowed down, I have felt it until it seemed as if my spirit would be crushed. Yet at the same time it was lifted up until the exceeding weight of glory became too great a joy, too overwhelming for flesh and blood. Here is a person who has lost all his possessions and is very poor. He is met tomorrow morning by a generous friend who says to him, Fear not, I will share half of what I have with you. You know that I am a person of considerable wealth. Do not be afraid. I know your losses, but I am with you. I feel sure that any person approached in this way would go home and say to himself, Well now, my troubles may be over. I am rich, since half of what my friend has is more than I had before. Yes, but may not the same losses that fell upon you fall upon your friend? May not the same reversals in commerce that made you poor also make him poor? In that case, you are as worse off as ever. Besides, your friend may change his mind. He may find you much too expensive a client, and he may shut his door against you one of these days. Now, though, God says to you, I am with thee. The Lord has much more than your friend has. He is much more faithful. He will never grow weary of you. He cannot change his mind. Numbers 23, 19. Surely it is better for you to feel that God is with you than to rely upon an arm of flesh. Is it not so? Believer, you will never prefer man to God, will you? Will you prefer to rest in a poor, changeable man's promise rather than to rest upon the unchangeable covenant of God? You would not dare to say that, although I dare say that you have acted as if you would. I am afraid that our unbelief is such that sometimes we would really prefer the poor arm of flesh to the almighty arm of God. What a disgrace to us! When our mind is clear, though, we must confess that God's I am with thee is better than the kindest assurance of the best of friends. Someone may be engaged in Christian service and has been working hard. Would you not feel very happy if God were to raise up a dozen young people who would rally round and help? Oh, yes, you say. Then I could go to my grave saying, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace since there are so many others enlisted in the good cause. Luke 2.29. But is this so? Might they not also grow as weary as yourself? And what are they compared with the world's needs? May they not soon be taken away or prove unfaithful? If God says, I am with thee, is not that better than twenty thousand of the best and brightest people and even of thousands and thousands of the most industrious missionaries? For what would they all be without God? The only comfort they can bring you is that which they would have to first borrow from Him. Take the plain promise of God, for it is enough, and more than enough, even if all of earth's springs were dry. Charles H. Spurgeon A Brief Biography Charles Haddon Spurgeon was born on June 19, 1834, in Kelverdon, Essex, England. He was one of seventeen children in his family, nine of whom died in infancy. His father and grandfather were nonconformist ministers in England. Due to economic difficulties, eighteen-month-old Charles was sent to live with his grandfather who helped teach Charles the ways of God. Later in life, Charles remembered looking at the pictures in Pilgrim's Progress and in Fox's Book of Martyrs as a young boy. Charles did not have much of a formal education and never went to college. He read much throughout his life, though, especially books by Puritan authors. Even with godly parents and grandparents, young Charles resisted giving in to God. It was not until he was fifteen years old that he was born again. 
He was on his way to his usual church, but when a heavy snowstorm prevented him from getting there, he turned in at a little primitive Methodist chapel. Though there were only about fifteen people in attendance, the preacher spoke from Isaiah 45:22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Charles Spurgeon's eyes were opened, and the Lord converted his soul. He began attending a Baptist church and teaching Sunday school. He soon preached his first sermon, and then, when he was sixteen years old, he became the pastor of a small Baptist church in Cambridge. The church soon grew to over four hundred people, and Charles Spurgeon, at the age of nineteen, moved on to become the pastor of the New Park Street Church in London. The church grew from a few hundred attenders to a few thousand. They built an addition to the church, but still needed more room to accommodate the congregation. The Metropolitan Tabernacle was built in London in 1861, seating more than five thousand people. Pastor Spurgeon preached the simple message of the cross, and thereby attracted many people who wanted to hear God's word preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. On January 9, 1856, Charles married Susanna Thompson. They had twin boys, Charles and Thomas. Charles and Susanna loved each other deeply, even amidst the difficulties and troubles that they faced in life, including health problems. They helped each other spiritually, and often together read the writings of Jonathan Edwards, Richard Baxter, and other Puritan writers. Charles Spurgeon was a friend of all Christians, but he stood firmly on the Scriptures, and it didn't please all who heard him. Spurgeon believed in and preached on the sovereignty of God, heaven and hell, repentance, revival, holiness, salvation through Jesus Christ alone, and the infallibility and necessity of the Word of God. He spoke against worldliness and hypocrisy among Christians, and against Roman Catholicism, ritualism, and modernism. One of the biggest controversies in his life was known as the downgrade controversy. Charles Spurgeon believed that some pastors of his time were downgrading the faith by compromising with the world or the new ideas of the age. He said that some pastors were denying the inspiration of the Bible, salvation by faith alone, and the truth of the Bible in other areas such as creation. Many pastors who believed what Spurgeon condemned were not happy about this, and Spurgeon eventually resigned from the Baptist Union. Despite some difficulties, Spurgeon became known as the Prince of Preachers. He opposed slavery, started a pastor's college, opened an orphanage, led in helping feed and clothe the poor, had a book fund for pastors who could not afford books, and more. Charles Spurgeon remains one of the most published preachers in history. His sermons were printed each week, even in the newspapers, and then the sermons for the year were reissued as a book at the end of the year. The first six volumes, from 1855 to 1860, are known as the Park Street Pulpit, while the next fifty-seven volumes, from 1861 to 1917, his sermons continued to be published long after his death, are known as the Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit. He also oversaw a monthly magazine-type publication called The Sword and the Trowel, and Spurgeon wrote many books, including Lectures to My Students, all of grace, around the wicket gate, advice for seekers, John Plowman's talks, the soul winner, words of counsel for Christian workers, checkbook of the bank of faith, morning and evening, his autobiography, and more, including some commentaries, such as his twenty-year study on the Psalms, the treasury of David. Charles Spurgeon often preached ten times a week, preaching to an estimated ten million people during his lifetime. He usually preached from only one page of notes, and often from just an outline. He read about six books each week. 
During his lifetime, he had read The Pilgrim's Progress through more than one hundred times. When he died, his personal library consisted of more than twelve thousand books. However, the Bible always remained the most important book to him. Spurgeon was able to do what he did in the power of God's Holy Spirit because he followed his own advice. He met with God every morning before meeting with others, and he continued in communion with God throughout the day. Charles Spurgeon suffered from gout, rheumatism, and some depression, among other health problems. He often went to Menton, France, to recuperate and rest. He preached his final sermon at the Metropolitan Tabernacle on June 7, 1891, and died in France on January 31, 1892, at the age of 57. He was buried in Norwood Cemetery in London. Charles Haddon Spurgeon lived a life devoted to God. His sermons and writings continue to influence Christians all over the world. This has been Words of Cheer for Daily Life Messages to Encourage the Heart, written by Charles H. Spurgeon, narrated by Scython Williams, copyright 2021 by Aneco Press, production copyright 2021 by Aneco Press.